Playing on the computer, the boy says that he is now on his third attempt to survive the zombie apocalypse. He says he hopes to get good weapon this time and acquires a bat. He feels confident because ammunition is limited and guns attract a lot of zombies. If he were in an apocalypse, he would choose a bat every time. Suddenly, he sees something on the screen and the crazy guy does a reverse push-up on the chair. However, he did all this for $0.76. I take back what I said because the fool fell to the floor like an idiot and hit his head. However, at the same moment, Chiansu got up and asked the guy if he liked that. The guy named only one asked what he was doing and said he was dead. That's when he realizes his character had been killed and apologizes to the live stream for it. However, he says it's okay because he reached the checkpoint and now with this item it will be easy, so he just needs to try again. Meanwhile, only one calls out to Chinaunsu and asks if he is really having fun when he is the only person watching the stream. Our boy falls silent for a second. His name is Chinsu Gyo. He's a streamer and replies that only one doesn't need to say such things, adding that he can only live off live streaming because this guy is always there. The guy asks if that's true and says that if it is, he chooses him. Kiansu is confused by this, but thanks him for choosing. Suddenly, the entire room starts shaking and he stands up, asking what's happening. There's a huge explosion and he asks the live stream if anyone heard that. Immediately, he runs to the window and sees the entire city in flames. People are running and he tells the live stream that something is wrong. That's when he sees his computer is turned off and won't turn back on. He is confused and decides to go outside to see what's happening. As soon as he is on the street, a woman runs past him and he calls out to her. However, she just glances at his face and runs away desperately. He is confused about why she is fleeing when suddenly several messages appear in his view. Some messages say he looks very silly, and others ask why they chose such a loser. At that moment, he is startled and asks why there is a chat window in front of him. People in the live stream start mocking him, imitating everything he says. As he tries to touch the chat, wondering if he is hallucinating from streaming for too long, some messages say he can't touch it, while others say something is coming for him. That's when he notices a zombie in front of him, and the chat says that now he will die. It was terrible watching a player as bad as him. Chiansu can't process this information when suddenly the zombie lunges at him. However, falling backward, he manages to kick it and retreat. He starts to run away and people in the live stream say that the zombie just wanted to shake hands. Desperate, he reaches his apartment and starts entering the code. However, the zombie immediately breaks through the glass. The creature's face is covered in blood and he starts climbing the stairs desperately, but the monster won't stop chasing him. He is already on the seventh floor and can't increase the distance between them. Finally, he sees the door to the roof and tries to open it, but unfortunately, it's locked. The zombie is climbing the stairs and the chat tells him to stop being stupid and push the door. With that, it finally opens and he closes it with his own body. The zombie was pounding on the door, but at least he could rest a little. On the roof, he was wondering why a zombie suddenly appeared and why there was a game-like chat in front of him. However, putting that aside, the goal now was to kill this monster. He needed a weapon and heard something behind him. When he looked, there was already a chubby guy approaching. He recognized him as the owner of the buildings and started to run. However, the fool tripped over a box and fell to the ground with the zombie closing in. As he tried to resist, someone in the chat mentioned there was a supply chest nearby. Chiamansu looked to the side while the zombie was almost biting him. He kicked the creature back and it came running at him again. Chiamansu shouted for the trash to die and moved to the side. With that, the zombie threw itself off the building, diving to another life. The chat was curious if he was lucky or had planned it. Exhausted, he fell to the ground, but it was little time because the zombies were starting to break the door. He noticed there were three of them, and the chat commented that many beginners always die this way. That's when he stumbled upon the chest and remembered the guy who asked if that was a supply box. He smiled, opened the chest that radiated light, and found the legendary bat. The chat called it the Excalibur of the Apocalypse as the zombies broke through the door to get to our boy. While he concentrated, everyone was betting that he would die. Smiling, our boy said that for him, the end of the world was just a game, and he charged forward. He swung the bat at the first zombie, but missed entirely. He found himself surrounded and began shaking the bat, telling the creatures to get away. Now everyone on the live stream started calling him a clown. The problem was that the zombies were so close that he couldn't swing the bat properly. While he was immobilizing one, another came from behind. He knew he had to dodge, so he dropped the bat and threw himself to the ground to avoid being bitten. The zombies were closing in from behind, and he had no space to swing the bat. In that case, he broke free and the creatures attacked. He managed to get through and the chat marveled at how impressive he was. Back in his room, people were saying he was more impressive than they expected. However, Chiansu realized that both his computer and phone were not working. The chat asked where he was going and he said he was heading to his parents' house. With that, he was already speeding on his bike despite his age. He decided to ignore the chat for now and focus on his parents' safety. While he was checking how much gas he had left, something darted in front of his bike. He fell to the ground and people in the chat asked if that was a tongue. He saw the message and was confused. When he looked to the side, the chat informed him that it was a hellish frog. Chiansu was baffled. It wasn't a zombie, but a real monster. His thoughts were interrupted by a tongue lash, which he dodged. 
Someone in the chat commented about the tongue, and a ruler appeared, giving him an idea. He decided to run in a straight line into a tunnel, dodging another attack. Since the place had many curves, the monster wouldn't be able to hit him. At least he had brought some items that appeared to be intact. The frog cornered him, but the boy already had a Molotov in hand, taunting the Dan frog to come at him. The chat commented on how brave he was when the frog headbutted, but he dodged. He set the rab on fire and threw it at the fool. The problem was it didn't do anything, so he threw another one in its face. Seeing this, the boy was sure the frog's weakness was from the inside out. He only had one more and would have to risk his life to make it work. Hiding behind a wall, he taunted the frog to come. The creature lashed out with its tongue, and he dodged. He grabbed the molotov and threw it into the monster's mouth. It writhed in agony and fell back. The chat was now impressed that he risked his life to make this plan work. Watching the frog, he said it was finally over, but the chat told him to be careful. Someone commented that he was one of the best beginner players they had ever seen. Our boy wondered why they were commenting on his life as if it was all a game. However, he decided not to care if it was real or not and simply accept it. He told everyone he wouldn't die like an idiot. At that moment, he received an achievement and the ability to record his feats. Seeing the notification about receiving an ability, he was sure it was exactly like a game. So he asked to open the skills panel. The aggro skill made him stronger the more creatures were around him. The save record skill allowed him to gain part of the attributes of this ability as base attributes that he would always have available. He realized this ability was basically a request to throw himself into danger. He closed the panel, decided to ignore it for now, and resumed his quest to find his family. The problem was that his bike had been destroyed by the frog. He had to walk, and when he arrived, he couldn't believe his eyes. His house looked like it had been bitten by something gigantic. He entered desperately, calling for his mom and dad, questioning where they were. However, he couldn't find them anywhere. Then he remembered that his parents always left notes. He started walking around the house, looking for any messages. Finally, in his room, he found a piece of paper. His guy had written that they were evacuating with the soldiers of Division 7.5 and that they would see each other soon. At least now, he had a clue about where his parents had gone. The chat was mocking him for being abandoned by his parents like a fool. While he was talking to himself, he felt that something was wrong. That kind of message wasn't like the ones his dad usually left. However, he remembered that if this was really a game, this could be the start of the first main quest. He decided not to rush too much since he only had one clue so far. He went to the cupboard and found some canned sardines. The chat commented that he was too relaxed, and he replied that he needed to eat something first before figuring out what to do. Then he heard a sound near the house. There shouldn't be any creatures, so what happened? He walked calmly through one of the rooms and heard another sound. With that, he knew the direction and ran there. At the window, he found a zombie climbing up. He hit its hand and closed the door. This triggered the aggro skill. He had one creature in 10 minutes. He remembered that he could get 10% stronger for each enemy following him. He decided to test this out. In one of the doors, there was a zombie breaking through. He opened it and hammered it, increasing the aggro count to two. The boy was enjoying this because he went to another door and took down the third and fourth zombies. Then the fifth, sixth, and seventh. He didn't stop. He put everyone there to sleep for a bit. Looking at his own hand, he realized that this skill really made him much stronger. Then he heard a sound and realized it was coming from the kitchen. Since he only had one minute of aggro left, he had to finish it within that time. Slowly, he approached, and the chat asked who they thought would win. He looked down and saw a guy hiding under his table. A moment later, the guy, who apparently worked in a restaurant, was cooking. The chat thought he was very brave to let a stranger cook for him in his own house. The protagonist didn't know how to address the chat, so he called them brothers. He explained that he was fighting monsters on an empty stomach and needed something to eat. Not to mention, if this guy seemed dangerous for even a second, he would deal with it quickly. With that, the guy placed the plate on the table. Shiansu, feeling fully healed, thought it actually looked good. The long-haired guy asked if he liked it and mentioned that he was one of the chefs at the Mayong restaurant. The protagonist said that because of the commotion the guy caused, he had to fight a bunch of zombies. Just before, the guy was apologizing and begging not to be kicked out because of the zombies outside. Chiansu informed him that he would leave this place as soon as he finished his meal. The guy asked where he was going and Chiansu said he was looking for information about his father. With that, another guy suggested they should head to the elementary school because it had become an emergency shelter. The protagonist thought that might be a good place to get information about his father. However, he started to wonder if this guy was a real person or some kind of NPC guiding him through the story. He agreed, and the guy introduced himself as Mingyu Zhang. Qianzu thanked him for the food and said it was time for them to go. He asked if Mingyu had any transportation, and Mingyu said no. Qianzu then mentioned they had a bike in the garage and said they would use that and gather his things. Mingyu agreed and waited for him. Kanansu went back to his room, grabbed a hammer, and suddenly heard a scream. It was Mingyu's voice, and he ran outside to see what looked like a titan zombie holding Mingyu. Mingyu cried for help, and the chat said it was the big mouthed one. The protagonist knew that creature was much stronger than those zombie frogs from before. The chat mentioned it was probably the one that had bitten his house. With that, he started to run, and the chat warned that if he tried to help, he would die. The next moment, he was on the bike, fleeing the place. 
When he looked back, the creature had grown on him, and the 10 minute timer started. He and Zeus sped up the bike, but the monster was much faster than he thought. At this pace, he would be caught before passing it. Then he saw his friend's bike, which Mingyu had mentioned dropping. Two more zombies had grown on him, and he threw himself to grab the friend's bike. With that, he accelerated, almost getting caught. The chat was impressed. The problem was that the monster was still beside him. But Chiansu told the live stream that he wasn't the type to fall without a fight. The scene shifts to a group evacuating people, directing everyone to enter the school. A chubby guy says that Mingyu is still out there, and they need to rescue him. The other guy just says he's probably dead, and tells the chubby guy to get inside. A commotion starts with people saying they should wait a bit longer before closing the gates. But then a guy with a white bandana tells his friend that it's better for them to get inside for now. At that moment, they hear someone speeding up a motorcycle. It's our boy carrying something. People turn around, and he comes to a stop. The guy causing the commotion looks scared. Seeing what he's carrying on the bike, everyone wonders if it's a body. He just smiles, and the chat says it seems like he loves to draw attention. The guy next to him recognizes it as Mingyu's bike and asks how he is. Our boy dryly says he's dead. The guy looks confused, asking for an explanation. Chiyansu just says there's nothing to explain and asks who the leader is there. A man seems to hear this, and as he's about to speak, another person approaches. A police department guy introduces himself as Sujin and says he's coordinating that area. Chiyansu gives his name and Sujin asks if he really brought a piece of that monster. Chiyansu is surprised that Sujin knows about the creature. He explains that they lost a lot of people to that monster and asks what happened to it. Chiyansu says he killed it. Everyone is stunned not believing that it's possible to kill such a thing. Back on the bike, he asked the chat if they wanted to bet that he would survive. They asked what he would bet, and the crazy guy said obviously his life. The monster was running and destroying all the buildings easily. The protagonist noticed that the monster didn't seem to get tired and turned to the chat, saying they would have to do him a favor if he survived. The chat started commenting that they wouldn't gain anything from this and knew he would fail. One asked what would happen if he didn't kill it, and he said in that case, he would die. The chat commented that if the plan was this crazy, it would accept. The same guy from before, only one was there saying the deal was made. Chiyansu smiled and sped towards the tunnel. The creature was approaching, but he told everyone they would have to keep the promise. The monster, running at 100 miles per hour, rammed into the tunnel. Chiyansu told the guy at the shelter he would explain more later, and that he was also looking for a safe place. Kiansu says they first need to check if he is not infected. However, the townspeople say he is a hero and should be let in right away. So he gets in line, and after they verify he's not infected, he's about to leave when someone suddenly calls out to him. It's the guy from before, asking if Mingyu really died. Kiansu says he already told them and asks if the guy knew him. The man replies that yes, he was the owner of the restaurant where Mingyu worked. Kiansu then explains that they were together and had a plan, but that monster ruined everything they were trying to do. Grabbing the bike, he says he didn't steal anything and doesn't need to worry, and that the tofu soup Mingyu cooked was something he would never forget. The chat says that this man made the guy cook for him, and now he's acting all righteous. The shop owner is left speechless, and with that, Kiansu leaves. As he approaches the school, he passes a blue suitcase, and a message appears, saying he's leaving the tutorial. It explains that now you will have the information panel to help him stay alive. What catches Chiyansu's attention is the mention of a tutorial. There are also several messages, saying that now everything will truly begin. He runs to a room and calls out for only one, explaining that there is a limit to how much he can handle without knowing anything. He reminds him that they made a bet, so he has to pay up. Only one asks what he wants to talk about. Chiyansu says it's time for him to start explaining what is going on. The chat is angry that he ignored everyone and asked if he received any explanations. Kiansu says none at all. They are impressed that he is still alive and question how he seems to know so much. Chiansu, confused, says it's his streamer instincts. The chat then comments that this is a very interesting detail. Someone mentions that if he wins the game, he can rebuild the world however he wants. Chiansu is confused by this, and only one says that's exactly what they said. He explains that in this world, everything is real. The only thing they did was change a few details, but he is the only player. This group only likes to follow one person at a time, so he is the protagonist and the only one who interacts with them. Considering this, it can be said that the other people are somewhat like NPCs. However, only one advises him not to stress too much about the fact that it is the real world and to just treat them like viewers of his streams and keep winning the game. Xianzu is overwhelmed by all this information and asks who they are. Looking to the side, he wonders if this guy is some kind of god or something. He looks at his reflection and asks if only one is a god. Only one says that's a stupid question to ask. What kind of character thinks about such things? He says he'll give just one hint that will help him. They like a guy who puts on a good show, so it's best for him to go all out and show everything he's got. Our boy remarks that it's a strange mission for someone who never leaves the house. He then remembers the information panel and opens it. It says that the first mission is to protect the police chief because if he dies tonight, the whole city will deteriorate. A little later outside, he is observing the people working. A guy asks if they should leave the food there and another says yes. 
People are gathered in the courtyard and the police are giving some orders. Kiansu knows that out of the 150 people there, someone is a threat to the police chief. The officer announces that they will be providing food for everyone, so they should come closer. One of them calls the protagonist, but he ignores him, saying he's fine. He approaches a man who asks if he has a problem. He says he's there to see the police chief, and the man seems startled. By the man's lack of reaction, he questions if there's a problem, and the officer responds that he can't say. The chat comments that this seems suspicious, and Chansu is sure something is being hidden. He points to the officer and asks if he can call for Department Chief Sujin Lee. The man converses with someone, seeming to ask for permission to disclose certain things. He asks the protagonist if he killed the monster, to which Chiansu replies affirmatively. The man then says he'll tell the truth. They are looking for skilled people like him because the police chief went out on patrol and disappeared. Kansu realizes the mission won't be easy and questions why no one is looking for him. The man explains that they don't have enough people to both protect the area and search for the chief. Chiansu asks if he can take a look at the chief's office, approaching and saying they don't need to hide anything from him. After all, they don't have time, and the more information he has, the better. Sweating, the man agrees, and a while later, Chiansu enters the temporary office. He tells the Chak to keep an eye out for clues, but no one finds anything. Then he sees a map with a mark on it. He knows that place is not far from there. At that moment, someone is behind him. He asks who it is, and the person says they heard he's looking for the chief. The guy enters and extends his hand, saying he heard the boy defeated a pretty strong monster. The guy introduces himself as Gaiyong and goes for a handshake. However, he oddly exerts a lot of force, asking if Chiansu found anything. The guys in the chat tease Chiansu, calling him too weak. While Chiansu wonders why this jerk is doing that, they hear a scream and everyone runs out, asking what happened. They see some infected among the crowd. People are trying to flee, but once two or three are bitten, there's no escape. Chiansu wonders why this is happening, and the chat warns that it's going to turn into a mess. He grabs the hammer, thinking he needs to help the people. He heads towards the crowd, while the police can't use their guns without hitting civilians. Kiansu takes down the first infected, shouting at the police to use their batons. He looks back and yells at the officer to do something. Even the restaurant guy says he'll help, holding a frying pan. The guy with the bandana tells Mr. Gaiyong to be careful, but Gaiyong swings the frying pan at the infected. Kiansu turns and takes down a couple more. Gaiyong realizes Chinansu is buying him time to finish the job. If that's the case, he does his part, hitting the infected three times with the pan until the police start to assist. Meanwhile, people are shouting to open the gates so they can escape. Seeing everything locked, Kiansu is sure some bastard let an infected in. Chansu believes the only person with the authority to do that is a police officer who has lost his mind. He tells the live stream that he can't deal with this now, so he's going to find the police chief. He approaches Gaiyong and tells him to keep an eye on the police because he has something to do. Gaiyong looks confused, but Chiansu says there's no time to explain and that he's giving this tip as repayment for Mingyu's kindness. With that, he starts to run, and someone asks where he thinks he's going. A policeman blocks him, but Chiansu just says they need to worry about themselves. He returns to grab the bike he was on before and tells the chat that staying there would interfere with his plans. He's sure there's something suspicious about the place marked on the map. A while later, he reaches a container in the middle of the forest. Looking through the windows, there's no one inside, but the floor is full of footprints, making him wonder if it was a bunch of zombies. He turns to the chat and asks when he will receive a new supply chest. The guys respond that they thought he was playing on hard mode. Kiansu says no way, it's already too hard, and he needs help. One of them jokes that supplies are paid for, so we'll have to put some money into the game. Kiansu seemed confused about this paid content business, and they told him to check the bottom of the chat. He scrolled down and found a dollar sign. When he clicked it, he saw that donations were disabled. The chat urged him to activate it immediately. Once he turned it on, he unlocked monetization, and only one sent him one zen. Two others sent two more zen each, and he was furious that these jerks were hiding this just to make the game harder. With that, he entered the container, which looked like an ordinary house. The chat asked if he was mad at them, and he said he held no grudges. However, he knew very well that there was a lot these guys weren't explaining. He began to wonder why the mark on the map led to this house. Suddenly, zombies appeared out of nowhere at the window, startling him. The aggro was activated, and he realized those footprints really were from zombies. The chat laughed, asking why he was scared of his friends, but the aggro kept increasing. Kansu saw that he was going to be surrounded and kicked the first zombie at the door. The aggro went to 8 and quickly passed 14. His physical abilities were now increased by 240%. Though if he was surrounded, he was dominating. Then he heard a horn and saw a car approaching. He dodged to avoid being hit and realized it was the same guy who led zombies to the school. The guy was hiding behind the glass, but Chiansu told the trash to come out because he knew who it was. It was Gaiyong who wondered how this trash dodged like that. Not to mention this damn kid was handling a bunch of zombies on his own. Gaiyong was fuming and said he would bury him in the mud. Chiansu was startled and Gaiyong accelerated. He ran over something and stopped the car, saying he wanted to see how messed up Kiansu was. But it was just a zombie. Someone knocked on the window. It was Chiansu, telling him to open it. Gaiyang was startled, but Chiansu elbowed him. 
With his physical strength increased to this level, it was easy. Gaiyang moved to the side, grabbed an airsoft gun, and tried to shoot, but Chianzu ducked. Gaiyang accelerated, trying to escape. Looking in the rearview mirror, he saw Chianzu running after him. He couldn't believe it was possible, especially since he was already going 80 miles per hour. Chianzu ran desperately with a chat saying the kid was furious. Jiayang enraged said Chianzu was going to learn a lesson. He found himself near some containers and started to maneuver around them, trying to lose Chianzu. Chianzu calls out to Gaiyang, but the guy reaches into the glove compartment, presses a button, and wishes him good luck. The containers open, revealing they are full of zombies. The chat says that now he's screwed, but Chianzu's aggro is already at 40. Jiayang accelerates, saying it's too late for Chianzu to regret anything. However, with 500% increased physical ability, Chiyunsu says he will finish this in two minutes. The first zombie goes down quickly, and the sequence begins. Even though he's easily defeating them, there are still many more. He sees that Jiayang is parked next to a tree and decides that he will kill that bastard first. He runs, approaches, and breaks the window just as Gaiyang is sending a message. Chiyunsu demands to know where the police chief is. Gaiyang tries to reach for his waist again, but Chiyunsu stops his hand. The chat warns him to watch out for Gaiyang's left hand, and Chiyunsu immobilizes him again. Gaiyang asks who this damn kid is, and Chiansu says he is very loved by his fans. He kicks Gaiyang, saying he's the one driving now. Chiansu takes control of the car, muttering that this idiot has complicated things for him. Gaiyang is left unconscious, drooling. Chiansu finds a pair of handcuffs, and the chat suggests he'll get money if he cuffs Gaiyang there. Chiansu is amused by the idea until he sees the zombies approaching. He cuffs Gaiyang and accelerates the car, plowing through the zombies. Then he realizes he should have paid more attention to the panel. The message had said from the beginning that police chief Myong was at the food school. There was no reason for him to come here, but then he sees a teddy bear crossing the street. He tries to break but hits the toy, which spins and rolls on the asphalt. The chat laughs, and he asks if they also saw that creepy doll walking. Suddenly, the teddy bear stands up, and he is left bewildered, unsure of what to do. The little monster clearly seems to be looking at him when it suddenly starts to run away. The protagonist asks what the hell that is, and only one explains that it is the only bear. He explains that it's different from a monster and always guides you directly to a reward chest. Kianzu notices Gaiyang starting to wake up and the chat questions if he's going to follow the teddy bear. Kianzu grabs the taser and asks the chat to type 1 if they want the guy to go back to sleep and 2 if they want him to use the taser. Everyone types 1 but Kianzu chooses 2, tasering Gaiyang back into unconsciousness. He gets out of the car. The teddy bear walks through the forest and Kianzu follows, eventually finding the reward chest. The problem is that to open the chest, he needs to spend five of the zens he received. The shield icon indicates it's probably not a weapon. The chat urges him to stop stalling and just open it because it's getting tedious. He decides to ignore them and opens it. What he finds is an incredible flashlight. He feels a bit disappointed and says it was a waste. However, with no other option, he puts it in his pocket because it's time to return to the school. Back at the school, people are commenting on how incompetent one must be to let a zombie slip through. Kiansu says he didn't have any problem with the situation because he was there the whole time. He tells them not to worry too much and to keep the citizens calm. Someone calls for Chiansu, saying there's something that needs his attention. In a corner, he questions if they contacted Vyongo, who says they need to relocate the police. Chiansu imagines it's the fault of that damned kid. He says it's okay, and that he will handle the police chief, because the three of them are in this together. What he didn't know was that Gaiyang Go was there on the stairs listening to everything. Those bastards were indeed up to something. Gaiyang Go saw the men heading to the construction annex. There, another officer found Gaiyang Go's jeep. When they checked, they found him unconscious and handcuffed. Gaiyang Go was now running, certain that Chiansu was right. He needed to talk to the boy until a hand came across his face. It was Chiansu, saying he had found him. Chiansu asked what he discovered, and Gaiyang Go grabbed him, asking if he knew everything already. He explained that the police chiefs were in the basement and had people guarding the door. The scene shifts to Chiansu at the door, listening to the conversation inside. Chiansu says the guy knows how to take a beating, but asks him to stop. The guy prepares the taser while Chiansu is at the door, just observing. Then someone suggests in the chat that he should get a zen if he kicks the door in. With that, he opens the door and kicks the guy in the back. The guy falls to the ground like a fool, but earns Chiansu a zen. Chiansu stands up and reaches to pull out a weapon. But Chiansu stops his hand and asks if he knows who he is. Kneeling, Chiansu says he is the sense of humanity the guy lost. The guy tries to turn the gun, but Chiansu blocks his arm. After missing several shots, the guy clicks once more, but no bullets come out. Chiansu smiles, asking if that was the last one. He punches him in the face, saying that was for Mingyu. He hits him again on the chin, saying that's for the police, and a final blow, saying this one is for everything he had to go through. He sees the police chief unconscious and demands the keys be handed over. The guy reaches for his back, trying to grab the taser, but Chiansu hits him with the same taser. Chiansu remarks that it's too much of a coincidence that they have identical ones. He pushes him, telling him to say hi to Gaiyang. The chat urges Chiansu to finish him off, but he says there are more people coming, so it's not over yet. Chiansu stands up and looks to the side. 
As another guy passes by, he quickly strikes and neutralizes him. The chat is impressed by his cold-blooded efficiency, and Shiemsu comments that the guy was too loud. He earns another batch of Zens and feels proud of himself. A voice in the background asks if he really killed a police officer. Suddenly, he turns around and says it's time to finish this. He approaches the guy, asking if he has any preference for how he wants to die. The guy pleads for him to wait, but Chiansu says it will be quick. He offers a choice. Start with the arm, leg, or chest, or maybe the last option. He smiles, saying the guy looks very scared for someone who shot at him earlier. He receives another zen and smiles in thanks. As the guy screams, it seems he's done for. The chat laughs, saying the guy even went himself. Chiansu, embarrassed, asks what the guy is doing. Meanwhile, outside, people notice something and turn around. It's Hiemsu bringing the real police chief. He tells the officers that the traitors are tied up in the basement. The other officers run to check, and now Chiansu feels he has finally resolved the situation. He looks at the panel, which warns that staying in the same area for too long is dangerous. The next morning, he is full from eating in one of the cabins. Reflecting on how much things had improved in the past day, he opens the panel and finds the information about staying in the same place very odd. He asks the chat how long is too long, but they seem unwilling to answer. Kansu gets up and stands in front of a car when someone calls out to him. It's the police chief, who asks why he's leaving already. The boy asks if there's a problem, and the chief offers to provide some supplies if he's really going. After all, he helped the people a lot. Kansu recalls the moment he asked if the chief was really just going to expel the traitors, pointing out that those guys tried to take his life. The chief explains that it's hard to take the lives of two people who were once his comrades. Kansu says not to worry, he'll handle it. The next scene shows Chiansu speeding in a car with the two traitors tied up in the back. The officers beg him to stop, but he says he's not in the mood. As the chat says he's fixing things, the first officer gets bitten. After reaching almost 80 miles per hour, he stops. Seeing that no one is tied up anymore, he says that unfortunately, a little accident happened. Back in the present, the chief thanks Chiansu, who says he wouldn't refuse some supplies. The chief agrees and even offers the car, asking him not to leave without saying goodbye to everyone. Our boy sits in the car with the flashlight, wondering what it's for. The chat tells him not to stress and just wait to see what happens. He agrees and eventually falls asleep. He wakes up suddenly with an extreme feeling of cold. He has no idea how long he slept, but the air conditioning wasn't even on. Then he sees something approaching in the rearview mirror. Under a cloak is a skeletal creature. The chat warns that it has finally arrived. Kiansu immediately accelerates, drifts, and tries to get away. The police ask him to wait, but he just speeds past. He tells the chat to warn him next time instead of laughing at him. He looks and sees the creature has vanished. What he doesn't know is that it's right beside the window. The rearview mirror shatters and he accelerates again to put some distance between them. The chat tells him he'll need to move to another region. Otherwise, he won't be able to escape it. The monster suddenly appears in front of him and he crashes into a pillar. The airbag deploys, but Chiansu is badly shaken. The creature slowly approaches. Chiansu gets out of the car, pulls out his gun, and fires a shot. However, the monster is immortal. Seeing that it doesn't work, he starts running. After a while, he finds himself exhausted in a corridor. The chat comments that it looks like he's going to die today. The monster appears again in front of him and lunges. He uses the flashlight and the creature seems to shield itself. Being a gamer, he knew this kind of item had some utility. He uses this moment to run out the window and jumps onto a bicycle. The problem is that the tire is flat and he falls, injuring his knee. The monster approaches again. He throws the flashlight and keeps running. He tries firing more shots, but the creature continues to follow. Then he notices the monster and is suddenly stopped. Seeing a line on the ground, he understands. That's the limit of where the monster can go. He says this is the last shot and the creature disintegrates. However, our boy isn't doing well and collapses to the ground. Then something nearby catches his attention. A light flickers on and off repeatedly. He's curious, but everyone warns that it's definitely a trap. Kiansu says he has to check it out because it looks like Morse code. As he approaches, he throws himself in front and tells the person to stop. The person is Minchul Yang, who raises his hand saying he's not a bad person and asking Qianzu not to shoot. While Qianzu asks if he's a cop, the chat comments that they finally found someone more foolish than the protagonist. Qianzu asks if Minchul is alone and he says yes. Qianzu demands the flashlight, but Minchul hesitates. Qianzu points his gun and asks if he's really going to take that long. Reluctantly, Minchul hands over the flashlight and Qianzu asks for his backpack. Minchul pleads, saying it's all he has to eat, and if he gives it away, he's as good as dead. After some time, everything is on the ground and Chiansu says they have the same things. Poor Minchul is almost in tears, saying it's all he has. However, Chiansu crudely tells the boy to strip down to his clothes. Later, as he's dressing again, he asks if Chiansu will leave him now. Chiansu wants to know how a kid like him survived without carrying any weapons. He asks if Minchul is working with others and acting as bait. Chiansu tells the chat to keep an eye on the boy's face and turns around, saying they will separate. Minchul then speaks up, saying he suffered a lot to get there and that all his friends are dead. The only reason he's alive is because he's a coward. The chat comments that he seems sincere. Kiansu asks if that's true, 
and Minshul confirms it. Chienzu says okay and tells him to follow, stating he can't ignore a junior needing help. In the next scene, a guy is pinned down by a frog, wondering where Chienzu is. The poor guy is running from the big mouth monster and asks where it came from. Minshul Yang ignores him and tells him to turn left. The monster stumbles and crashes into a building. Minshul turns and tells Chianzu they will do the same thing near a stream. Chianzu smiles, telling him to worry about himself. They pass by an excavated area, walking along the edge. The monster tries to follow but ends up tripping and falling. They see a giant tongue blocking their path ahead, and Chianzu tells Minshul to duck when he gives the signal. As soon as he speaks, they both duck, and the tongue sweeps past. However, the monster was following closely and ended up with its mouth full. With that, the frog got angry, and the monster pulled it with its tongue. While the two creatures fought, Chianzu and Minkyul took the opportunity to escape. Chianzu smiled, thinking now it's clear how this kid survived. In the next scene, Chianzu is exhausted, asking if this tandem bike is Minkyul's big plan. Minkyul just tells him to keep pedaling, and Chianzu says he'll try. They are almost at their destination, a place with a good amount of resources. Minshul asks if he can ask something and inquires if Chianzu knows about Division 7.5. He explains that when he went looking for his friends, all he found was a note saying they were with that division. Chianzu responds that he's heard of them but doesn't know much. However, he's thoughtful because that's the same division that took his father. After a while, they arrive at a building. As they approach, a car comes and almost runs them over. Chianzu gets off the bike, saying it's never easy. He knocks on the window, and the chat asks if it's a zombie. He sees the guy is human and his name is Yeonjin Cho. He pulls him out of the car and throws him to the ground. Chianzu starts searching the car, saying he should have at least brought a rifle, but there's nothing useful in there. Yeonjin pulls a knife, telling Chianzu not to steal anything. Chianzu kicks him, telling him to shut up. Yeonjin apologizes, saying he can take whatever he wants. Chianzu grabs the knife and says it looks like Yeonjin is in deserter. He asks if he abandoned his comrades, and Yeonjin says no. In fact, everyone in his base is dead. Minkyul asks if Yeonjin is really a soldier, and Chiansu says you can tell just by looking at him. Then he notices something, goes to Yeonjin's neck, and pulls out his dog tag. Holding it in his hand, he tells Yeonjin to recite any service number. The poor guy starts sweating and slowly recites the numbers. Chiansu says he got it right, but still seems suspicious. Finally, Chiansu asks if he knows anything about Division 7.5. Yeonjin says no, he's never even heard of it. Chiansu stands up, and Minkyul says it's dangerous to stay there. He gets into the car and tells them to jump over the wire. Looking at Yeonjin, calling him useless, they wonder if they should take him. Yeonjin pleads to be taken along because his legs are broken, and it's impossible for him to survive alone. The protagonist notes that Yeonjin had previously asked to be left alone. Yeonjin explains that he thought they would harm him. The chat comments that Chiyansu would never save anyone, to which he replies that it's not fair. He tells Minchul to open the gate, and that he can bring Yeonjin if he wants to. Minchul agrees, and they head toward the building. Seeing four cars in the parking lot, Chiyansu wonders why the gate was closed. Opening the door, he tells everyone to be cautious as there might be someone inside. They walk in, and everything is silent. They take Yeonjin to the infirmary and Chiansu says he'll look around. Minxiul, acting like a scared child, pleads not to be left alone. Chiansu reassures him, saying he might not abandon him. Climbing the stairs, he asks the chat what they think about leaving the kid behind. The opinions are divided with one person saying the child seems genuine. Then he hears something, a voice talking about a safe place. When he opens the door, he sees a bunch of communicators, surprisingly still powered. The message states that Division 7.5 is heading to Jeju Island. Finally, Chiyansu has a clue and asks the system to open the information panel. It instructs him to escape the city via the train station. He runs back, calling for Minchiel, but upon reaching the room, he finds Yeonjin alone and asks where the kid is. Yeonjin says Minchiel heard some noises and went to check. Angry, Chiyansu demands to know how he could leave the boy alone then rushes out. He realizes he needs a taxi key to get out of there. Searching through papers, he realizes that people had turned off the lights despite having power, indicating something was wrong. As he looks for the keys, he hears a scream and runs. He finds Youngjin fallen on the floor and asks what happened. Youngjin asks for help getting up, saying he heard noises from the basement. At that moment, footsteps are heard coming up the stairs. Both are startled when a man uses Minchiel as a hostage. Minchiel tells Chiansu to run, but Chiansu refuses. He points a knife at the man, demanding he release Minchiel. The man, sweating, claims Minchiel is a thief who broke into his company. Pointing at both of them, he accuses them of being thieves, stating they have no more drivers left. Now Chiansu understands why he couldn't find any keys. Yeonjin was scared, and Chiansu blamed the company owner for sending his taxi drivers. He tried to explain that he wasn't a thief. All brightly, he claimed that, in fact, he was a new taxi driver there to help. The chat was confused by this, but Chiansu was trying to convince the man that he really was one of the best drivers and wanted to help in this crisis. The company owner, who had already lost his mind, said they really needed more drivers and asked where his resume was. Taken by surprise, Chiansu was a bit confused. The man said that for an interview, he needed to have brought a resume. 
Qianzu said he had already brought it and that it was in the office asking Yangjin to fetch it. Yangjin went and the company owner said Qianzu was very hardworking for wanting a job at such a time. Yangjin brought back a paper, telling Qianzu he found the most similar one. The owner just stared at it. Qianzu then told Minchul to come quickly. He gave the guy a shoulder bump and lunged towards them. Our boy took Yangjin's crutch and hit the company owner. He immediately instructed Minchul to restrain the man's legs and arms. They found the key and ran to the car, telling Yangjin to drive. The man asked where to go and Qianzu said to head for the train station. But then he saw people fleeing desperately, with a giant eye on their backs and couldn't believe it. A gigantic spider-like creature was chasing everyone. He told Yangjin he had faith he would get them out of there. Poor Yangjin had no idea what that thing was. The monster came their way and Yangjin just accelerated the car. He took a turn, but the problem was there was nowhere to escape. At that moment, the company owner had freed himself and called them a bunch of bastards. Kimsu told Youngjin to turn the car and head back to the main entrance. The owner was screaming for his taxi until he saw it coming with a monster. Right in front, they managed to drift, and the creature collided with a the building. They sped down the street. In the car, Youngjin asked if Qianzu really intended to use that guy as bait. Exhausted, Qianzu said the man was indeed a great company CEO. Minxiu commented that in the end, that was the best option for all of them to stay alive. Then Qianzu noticed something. Ahead of them was that blue line. As they passed it, it registered another checkpoint. Now the chat could give him missions, with harder missions offering better rewards. The live stream was celebrating, saying the guy who always maxes out cards was going to shine. Qianzu asked the chat if Minxiu could see them. The chat said he couldn't see or hear them when Qianzu spoke only to the chat. Looking at the system, Qianzu said he didn't see any functions listed and asked what it was. The guy who maxed out his card donated a zen and said Qianzu would understand soon. Qianzu put his hand out and said he was very anxious. Then he heard footsteps. Looking back, the creature was following them. He turned to Youngjin and asked if he could go faster, but Youngjin said he was already at maximum speed. The problem was the creature was gaining on them, and Qianzu wondered if it was faster in a straight line. He asked Minxiul if he knew another route, but Minxiul said no. Qianzu told the boy to think hard, and Minxiul suggested going up the mountain on the left. Youngjin said it would be slower, but Qianzu insisted, saying they would die otherwise. As they ascended, Qianzu noticed they were gaining distance. However, Youngjin warned about a sharp turn ahead. Qianzu asked Minxiul, who said just to keep going because the creature wouldn't be able to stop its momentum. Qianzu turned to the chat and asked for a mission to get a reward. The chat said he was doomed and Qianzu started to despair. Then the guy with the maxed out card put up a new mission. He needed to roll down the taxi window and start taunting the creature. In return, he would get a buff that would keep the car on track for 5 seconds. Qianzu immediately rolled down the window and started yelling that the creature was ugly as hell. The poor monster was left gaping. Qianzu continued shouting insults and Minxiul asked what kind of craziness this was. Qianzu kept yelling, daring the monster to try and kill him. The mission was completed, and the buff was applied. They saw the curve sign, and Youngjin made the turn. Thanks to the buff, the car stayed on the road while the creature was flown off. It wasn't just a curve, but a cliff, and despite the sign, the engineers deserved praise. Youngjin couldn't believe they hadn't been thrown off despite the creature bumping them. Minxiul was exhausted, and Qianzu thanked the guy with the maxed out card, who said Qianzu now owed him one. Some time later, Qianzu says he believed there would be more people because of the radio message. However, strangely, there isn't a single person at the train station. They decide to hide the car somewhere, though the rest of the way on foot. Youngjin mentions the zombies, but Qianzu says he'll take care of it. Minxiul asks if he's sure, and Qianzu reassures him. Qianzu then shouts for the creatures, commanding them to come closer. Three monsters turn towards him, increasing his power to 1.4. He begins to realize just how powerful this ability is. He easily takes down the creatures until one sneaks up behind him, but he tells them not to worry and swiftly deals with it. The chat comments on his bravery and growth, and he tells them to stop saying such cringe things. Nevertheless, he feels that somehow his strength and reflexes have increased. As they walk, he sees a man calling out for someone named Cham Guk Jong. Kiansu knows this is the name of the city's mayor and wonders if this man works for him. He asks the chat if he should save the man, and the guy with the maxed out card says yes. Despite most saying no, Kiansu decides he'll have to save him. The zombie is about to kill a man when it suddenly falls dead on top of him. The man, crying desperately, explains that the mayor had left him to die. He suggested they find another station because of the monsters, but the mayor refused, threw him out of the car and told him to look around, leaving him in this situation. Kimensu says it seems they'll find the mayor at the train station and the man confirms. He asks if the man was working as a bodyguard, but he says no. The mayor had hired different people for protection. Kimensu gets excited, thinking it's an important story mission. In front of the station, the man says he doesn't see his friends. Kimensu reassures him, saying they must be inside, and introduces himself as Kimensu Huang. Suddenly, the man stops and points at something, asking what it is. Kianzu notices it looks like a child, and the man is about to call out to her. Kianzu quickly covers his mouth, asking what he's thinking. Clearly, a child wouldn't be alone in a place like this. Up close, the chat says he's the unluckiest guy ever. 
She answers questions if it's that dangerous and asks for a reward. The chat says no, but the maxed out card guy donates 100 zens. Kiansu knows that one zen is worth 10,000 Korean won, which means about $700. He covers the man's mouth, grateful for the substantial donation. Hyamsu tells the guy to stay quiet and that he'll handle it because that girl is definitely not human. However, the girl suddenly turns and starts running. The guy, terrified, begins to descend the stairs desperately, but falls to the ground right in front of the monster. He yells that there's another one, and in that moment, he is devoured. Kiansu can't understand why the guy did that, and the chat comments that she is a silent girl. He realizes that by the name, she must be a type of monster that reacts to sound. Then someone named the new master puts up a mission. Kiansu cannot move until the girl passes him and will receive an ability that makes someone deaf for a minute. He knows this is very risky, and she passes by closely. The chat asks if she's looking right at him, and he stands still, sweating profusely. Finally, she passes, and the mission's effect is applied. Kiansu then goes to the guy's body, which is in good condition, and takes his wallet to check the name. However, as he turns, the guy starts getting up. Kiansu quickly finishes him off again. He runs as far away as possible, praying the monster isn't nearby. Then he sees one of the silent girls breaking down a door, and hears Minchul's voice screaming inside. He sees the girl, and contemplates. He starts to walk away, but the new master gives him a mission to rescue Minkyul and Youngjin from the bathroom. Seeing it's worth 20 zen, he knows it's worth it. He heads to a nearby diner, and the chat asks if he's that hungry. He looks at the timers and asks if the chat understands his plan. Meanwhile, in the bathroom, the two poor guys are trying to survive the silent girls. Then Chiansu appears at the door. The timer hits zero and starts beeping. The two monsters turn around and Chiansu runs out, throwing another timer to the other side. He throws two more in quick succession, leading the monsters away. With the creatures gone, Minchul finally relaxes. The chat asks why he didn't use the mission reward ability. He still has the skill to make someone deaf for a minute, but the problem is he has to touch them, and he knows he'd be cut in half if he got close to something like that. At that moment, the army guy informs him that his ankle is broken. Chiansu tells Minchul to help, and with that, the mission is complete. Then he hears a groan behind him and turns to see the army guy. Then he realizes that Youngjin seems to be starting to transform. His leg wasn't broken after all. Kiansu asks Youngjin if he knows what's happening. Remembering the guy who transformed earlier, Kiansu gets angry that they went through all this trouble for this to happen in the end. He grabs Minchul and starts running. Seeing Youngjin from a distance, Kiansu apologizes. Minchul asks what's wrong, and Kiansu says it's too late for Youngjin. They go to check the trains but don't find any useful information. Then they hear a noise and see Youngjin pointing to the side. Chiansu turns his head while Youngjin is relieving himself and notices that the train is strangely still functioning. Looking at Youngjin, Chiansu says he will never forget him. All he needs to do is remember this guy and finish the game to thank him. At the station, Chiansu tells Minchul to listen if he doesn't want to die. The train is bound to bring things they don't want, so he must stay on guard. Minchul says he understands, and an announcement is made that the train is arriving. They spot a wooden crate and decide to hide in it. The train approaches, and as it passes, it takes the creatures with it. At that moment, another locomotive passes by. Someone had apparently used the front train to lure the monsters. Kiansu knows that train was waiting for the mayor. He exits the crate, tells Minchul to stay put, and runs toward the train. He approaches slowly and sees the conductor standing there. A girl appears and asks why the damn mayor isn't there. Chiansu recognizes her from somewhere and remembers seeing her on the internet as an officer who was the hope for a better world. Her name is Suiyun Jang and she's questioning if those bastards from Division 7.5 are deceiving her. Kiansu thinks her personality is different from the interview, but he needs to get on that train. Seeing Minchul coming out of the crate, he knows they could both immobilize her, but it would be better to have her help. Minchul says it's just one person, so they can handle it. However, as Chiansu is about to approach, she asks who he is. Minchul is coming to strike and Chiansu asks where he got that telling everyone to stop. She says it seems like he thinks he can steal the train because she's alone. Chiansu says she misunderstood and shows her a card. She sees that the card says he works as security for the mayor, but doubts he's that tough. Chiansu says he has something to tell her, and the chat says here comes the craziness. He then announces that the mayor is dead. Suyan looks confused and asks what he's talking about, especially since they had to come here attracting a bunch of monsters. Suyan says things just got complicated, and his sound echoes through the station. Kiansu suggests they leave, but she insists she was hired to retrieve the mayor. Kiansu explains that he's the only one with information about the mayor and will explain once they reach the base. She hesitates for a second, but agrees, saying she'll take him to the shelter. Kiansu insists they need to bring his friend along. She looks at Minchiol and says he doesn't look like a city employee. Kiansu asks if she thinks it's right to abandon a student in the middle of nowhere. She relents but says she'll confiscate that pipe. With that, they start the train and begin to leave. At that moment, they see someone coming down. It's Yeonjin and Chiansu thanks him, saying they survived because of him. 
Just then, he's shoved to the ground as some guys come down the stairs. Kianansu sees it's the mayor, shouting for the train to stop. Suyan steps out of the cabin, asking what that noise is. The mayor reaches out, telling them to stop the train because she's there to save him. She asks Chiansu what's going on, and he tells her to look at what's following them. A bunch of silent girls are chasing them, and if they stop, everyone will die. She gets angry but returns to the train. The mayor calls them a bunch of bastards and asks how they dare leave him like this. Strangely, before dying, he says the code is the end. He falls to the ground and is devoured. Chiansu asks the chat if that wasn't the best option. The chat agrees, saying Yangjin is now different. Kiansu tells Minshul to get in. They go to the cabin and Suyan demands an explanation, saying they'll be thrown out otherwise. The protagonist brazenly says everything he said is true and the mayor is dead. She asks if he thinks she's an idiot, and Chiansu admits he never actually met the mayor. She slams him against the wall, demanding to know who he is. Kiansu apologizes, introducing himself as Chiansu. She questions why he lied and asks what his plan is. Chiansu tells her that he's just a passenger on this train and never claimed to be the person on the card. He only showed it. She yells in his face, saying he deserves to be thrown out the window. Chiansu explains that he only got the card because the original owner was left for dead. He knew the place was full of creatures and thought it was necessary to get them out of there. She kicks his foot, causing him to stumble and warns that he still deceived her. Chiansu recalls her interview where she mentioned people going through tough times. He says he's one of those people. She asks how he knows her name and gets flustered, saying it was just a small article. Chiansu doesn't understand why she's suddenly blushing but continues to praise her for being a beacon of hope in a new world. She turns away, embarrassed, saying that interview wasn't seen by many. She's unsure if he saw the article because he supports the police or was just bored. But then she says what's done is done, and they'll have to work together now. Chiansu asks if she guarantees they're heading to Daejin, and she confirms it. He then questions her about Division 7.5 and if she knows anything about them. So Ayn explains that during the apocalypse, they are responsible for a like on this video. Do you remember that the last chapter ended when he asked Suyan if she knew anything about Division 7.5? First, she told him to show some respect because she was 27 years old, so she was older than him. Secondly, she said it was really weird since she had never heard of this division before everything started. Our boy apologized and said that he was indeed two years younger than her. He then asked if it wasn't strange that this division was after the mayor. She explained that they had mentioned something about the administrative problem being difficult to manage with just the soldiers. Kiansu thought that apparently more people were involved in this than he had imagined. He thanked her for the information and said he would pay the price for the ride. She doubted he would really do something like that. But then Minchiel told him to take a look outside. Our boy asked what it was and approached the window. One of the silent girls had boarded. When Suyun was about to ask what was going on, Kiansu told her to stay quiet. He had no idea what to do. He knew that the creature was confused because of the tray noise. She started shaking and convulsing. He didn't know how to deal with her in such a tight space. That's when the chat said it was mission time. Kill the silent girl in five minutes, and the reward would be the ability to see through the eyes of anyone he touched for ten minutes. He was already angry with those cursed viewers who always gave him difficult missions. He told his friends that five minutes was too short. Couldn't they go a bit easier? Another viewer asked where the guy with the maxed out card was to give a better mission. Our boy was just waiting for things to improve when the super maxed out guy offered the mission to kill her in one hour, with a reward of the ability to increase his voice seven times louder for one minute. Our boy was excited that his favorite viewer was back. However, the viewers seemed to be fighting over these missions that were risking our boy's life, wondering if they really wanted Kiansu dead. They were indecisive, some wanting him to take the mission and others afraid of losing the whole adventure since he might die. Our boy didn't understand why they were arguing out of nowhere. And worse, he didn't know what to do either. It was a fight among the rich viewers who wanted to control him. But the missions had already been given, so he opened the door. The people in the cabin were startled. On the live stream, they told him not to do anything so reckless. Chimza realized that she still couldn't sense him because of the train noise. He activated the system ability that canceled the hearing of any target he touched for one minute. He took a deep breath and gave the silent girl a little tap on the shoulder. She immediately turned and screamed in his direction. But he just tossed her arm and she ran forward because she couldn't hear anything. With that, she fell out of the train like an idiot. Our boy smiled and said that was the wrong path. He went to check to confirm she was dead. However, the damn thing, even while being dragged on the ground, was climbing back up. He wondered what kind of zombie was so determined to stay alive. He started shouting at her to let go. People in the live stream said she couldn't hear him, especially since he stole her hearing, right genius? With that, she almost grabbed his foot, but he quickly jabbed her hand several times. Finally, she let go of the bar, falling to the ground abandoned. Our boy just washed all dirty, but then he noticed something. The hand he had stabbed several times was hurting like hell. The live stream people congratulated him, saying he was all messed up, but he really got the job done. With that, the mission was completed and he received the rewards. He returned to the cabin. 
asking if the viewers had seen what he did in five minutes. Minchul asked if he was okay and what had happened. Our boy said the problem was already solved, and Suyun said he was more impressive than she had imagined. He asked if she liked the performance, he said he handled it quickly, but even more impressive was how loud he could shout. Before he could laugh at the joke, our boy collapsed on the floor in agony, and Minchul asked what was going on. At that moment, she said they had received a radio call. He asked if it was from the so-called Division 7.5. Just a bit earlier, when he was stabbing the creature, a voice had asked if there was a problem. She and Su wanted to know what the guys had said. He explained that they would have to pass through another base area to confirm they weren't with anyone infected. He questioned what they said about the mayor thing. She said the plan was to go straight to Dajin, but as soon as she mentioned they didn't have the mayor, they told her to change locations and even return the train. In the middle of the explanation, Chiensu started to feel pain and she asked if something was wrong. He said yes, a lot was wrong. With that, the train continued on its way. And on the information panel, it showed that the people at this so-called checkpoint she was told to go to were actually a bunch of criminals. There was a station between this group they had to find and the city of Dajin, which was controlled by another group. Our boy realized that this checkpoint was a trap, and he asked the friends on the live stream how many people Suyun could defeat. The chat discussed among themselves and said maybe about five. She then asked why he had suddenly gone silent. At that moment, Chansu said it might be better to go straight past that checkpoint. She was confused, but he warned her that he was sure that place wasn't safe and asked if she trusted those people. The fact that they wanted the train back as soon as she said she didn't have the mayor was very suspicious. She said that he might be right because a base like that could be abandoned at any moment and they could fall into a trap. Chansu added that she also didn't fully trust the division. Considering how messy this world is, it's complicated to trust anyone 100%. She agreed that perhaps the best option was to ignore that checkpoint and head straight to the city of Dajin. He then said the only problem would be if those guys stopped them and asked if they could do that somehow. He explained that they could do it by changing the train's route. There's an incomplete line right where they would pass. If they changed this route, they would end up thrown off course. He added that afterward, there would likely be another checkpoint ahead, and people would come from both sides. Suyun agrees, saying it was inevitable that they would encounter some people. The scene then shifts to Donjin Station. Our boy activates the ability that increases his voice sevenfold for one minute. On the way, the guys hear the train arriving. Kiyonsu takes a deep breath and starts shouting at everyone, saying that the train was malfunctioning. The soldiers at the base were confused. They had no idea about this information and asked how they were supposed to stop the train. Inside the carriage, she asked why he took off his shirt. He explained that he wanted to confuse the guys to understand how the second checkpoint would react and to figure out their intentions. However, she wanted to know how he could shout so loudly, to which he replied that it wasn't important. With that, the train continued on the tracks. She started to notice that there were lots of zombies at these checkpoints, proving that everything was a mess. They would have to get off the train as soon as they were out of the tunnel. Outside, they told Minchul to sound the horn 30 minutes after they left. He asked why, and Chien Su explained it was to attract as much attention as possible once they were far away. He said he understood and told them to return safely. On the way, she questioned whether it was really safe to leave the train with the boy. Chien Su said there was nothing to worry about because his memory was very good. With that, they continued through the forest. A bit further ahead, they found the checkpoint. It was much smaller than he had imagined and very quiet. She said this was thanks to them stopping a train much earlier, so they didn't even feel the vibrations. The plan was to approach slowly using the trees and mountains. They walked through the forest until they encountered a group talking. One guy asked what they were going to do, and another responded that they should just kill if they tried to resist. They would only need the engineer alive. The two already realized that keeping them alive wasn't a priority. Suddenly, Suyan grabbed him by the arm. When Chien Su looked, he could see she was motivated to take down those guys. Our boy signaled that he understood. Meanwhile, the soldiers kept advancing through the forest until someone approached with a rope. Chien Su appeared behind the first one with a knife, stealing his weapon. At the same time, Suyan pulled another one by the neck with a belt and stole his weapon too. The two were already immobilized and the guys behind still didn't know what was happening. Our boy restrained one of them and activated the safety latch on his weapon. Meanwhile, Suyan was pulling the other by the neck to steal the weapon. She kicked him in the chest and the guy was thrown off the mountain. The two behind looked like fools, not even drawing their weapons. She asked who was going to kill whom there. The guys, seeing they had no chance, only said they were following orders. However, she ran toward them and landed a punch on the chin, saying, orders my ass. The other guy tried to react, but she hit him with a gun butt on the hand, making him drop his knife and then kicked him in the chest. Our boy then landed a butt stroke on the other one, sending him down the mountain. The poor guys were all scared, unable to react. Our boy was even telling them to wait a bit because he wanted one to interrogate, but it was too late. The live chat even commented that this is Sparta. They asked if Chiansu was complaining because he was afraid of being thrown down too. He then said that now they had a fully loaded weapon and asked if she had ever fired a gun. She said yes. He replied that it was good because they were going to do things more directly. On the way, she asked if he really wanted to go in destroying everything. He looked at the mountain 
and she asked what was up. That's when he noticed a legion climbing up the embankment. She asked how many creatures were there, and our boys said they needed to run away. A while later, they analyzed the checkpoint and saw about seven people. If they included whoever might be inside, there were at least ten in total. The chat asked if he was sure, and our boy said that it might not seem like it, but he was an excellent shooter in the army. Soyeon said that once he fires the first shot, that horde of zombies will come. He said he was used to working under pressure and told her to get in position. She got ready to make the first shot. However, suddenly, it was Chien Su who almost got shot. It seemed the enemy had spotted him first. The firefight was on, and our boy fired back. His aim wasn't weak, and he landed the first headshot. Behind the rock, he wondered if those guys had cameras or something like that. How did they locate him so quickly? Meanwhile, Suyeon told him to stop hesitating and shoot back. But just as he peeked out, he got shot in the shoulder. She asked if he was okay, and he replied it was just a graze. Our boy wondered if they could see inside the checkpoint. The guys explained that they could see the screen like a third-person game. Our boy had no idea how he would get out alive since these guys spotted him much faster and had way more ammo. He was missing all his shots, and the chat asked where the crazy guy was aiming. Then he heard a shout from the side. When he looked, Sueyeon had also been shot in the shoulder. He asked how much ammo they had left, and she said about 20 shots. Now he was scared because with just 30 shots total, they wouldn't be able to win this. The chat warned that the enemies were starting to surround them. He told Suyeon they would have to retreat. She asked where to. He said they would run first and figure it out later. With that, the enemies approached, firing. He told her to run while he provided cover. Once again, the boy landed a headshot. He ran while the enemies shouted at them to stop running away. The chat commented that it was too much just for two people and poor Minchiol was probably left alone. A bullet nearly took out our boy who started pleading for help from the chat, saying he was going to die like this. But the viewers only responded that it looked like a farewell. They weren't going to spend their coins on someone who was practically dead already. Another viewer suggested that the guy with the maxed out card send a mission, but someone else just said to let him die already. Kiansu remembered that to these people, he was just entertainment. It seemed they wanted a guarantee that he would survive. Then he shouted that he wouldn't die there and told Suyan that she better not die either. The plan was to run and lure all the zombies to surround them. She said there were hundreds on that mountain, and that it was madness to try something like that. But he said they had no other option. This was where they would turn the tables. He took a deep breath to gather his courage and let out a huge shout, attracting all the creatures and activating the aggro. He called more than 70 zombies and she asked what he was doing. Our boy kept shouting and telling them to come forward. Once again, Suyan asked what he thought he was doing. He said he would lead all of them straight to the checkpoint and told her to follow him from a distance. He wanted to know if she trusted him. She was lost and had no idea what to say to this madman. Who would trust someone like that in this situation? And he was indeed crazy. He ran toward the enemies bringing the zombies with him. However, just as the enemies ordered to shoot, he jumped. Man, he managed to get past them. The chat asked when this guy unlocked the super jump ability. He landed far away and the soldiers wondered if this guy was even human. How could anyone do that? He was already on top of a tree and the guys were trying to follow. That's when the chat realized that with 70 creatures chasing him, his physical strength had greatly increased. He was obviously heading toward the base and even the metal gate couldn't hold him back. Our boy continued shouting, attracting as many zombies as possible. Some soldiers came out of the base yelling to kill that guy. But then he noticed something weird. A crowd was coming from the door. He smacked the first one in the mouth with his gun butt, and we're back with Suyeon, who was also trying to survive the horde of creatures. However, in the midst of it, one almost bit her face off, but not before a hero of the day arrived and landed a blow on it too. She was in disbelief and our boy told her to climb on his back. She was confused, wondering if he really planned to carry her along the way. As she hesitated to respond, he grabbed her arms and threw her over his shoulder, telling her to hold on. He ran off and asked why she wasn't responding. She was trying to process what was happening and how he was so strong. He kept shouting at her and she asked what was up. He talked about needing to change the train's direction up ahead and told her to handle it. They had little time until the train passed, so while she was doing that, he would hold off the zombies. Meanwhile, inside the checkpoint, there was heavy gunfire. She was trying to move the controls, but her hands were shaking. Kiansu was taking down anyone who approached them. She kept pushing and our boy asked how long it was going to take. A few seconds later, she was finally done. Our boy struck another zombie and once again threw her over his shoulder. The poor girl was a bit awkward and confused. He told her that he could hear the horns, so the train was arriving. However, seeing its speed, he noticed something was wrong. It was moving too fast for him to get on. Could something have happened to Minchiel? But he didn't have time to think about that since the train wasn't stopping. He started running and Suyeon said the zombies were catching up. He saw that he had 35 seconds left before his aggro ability expired. He told her to hold on tight because they were getting on that train no matter what. Once again, he shouted at calling the zombies. She asked why he was drawing even more attention. However, our boy now had 87 aggro. He kept drawing attention, talking to himself that he needed more. The chat warned that at this rate, he wouldn't make it. Another viewer commented that without Shuyan, he could make it, he just needed to let her go. However, there she was covering his back. All Chien Su needed was just a little more time. 
He had 90 aggro and 14 seconds left. His physical abilities were boosted by 1000%. People in the chat praised him saying he was almost there. Suddenly, our boy told her to hold on tight, even if it hurt. With that, she was thrown. She slammed her back against the train, but before falling back, she managed to grab onto the bar. Seven seconds remained and he told her to hold on. He jumped, cursing Minchul as a bastard. He managed to get there and even saved her. When she looked up, our boy said he had caught her. With that, the timer hit zero seconds. The chat was impressed that he had managed to pull it off. They then started walking through the train. Our boy told the chat that he said he wouldn't die. However, that's when the two of them saw something terrifying. The door of the carriage was covered in blood. The smell was awful and Minchul was lying on the floor. She asked if the boy was dead, and he said they would first have to move the zombie. He approached to hit it with his weapon. With the body all dirty, he couldn't tell if Minchul had been bitten or not. Then someone in the chat called out to him and suggested that he should bash the guy's head just to be sure. People were laughing, while others told him to shut up because Chimensu wasn't okay. He kept calling Minchul, who wasn't responding. He said they would wait for him to wake up, and if he turned, he would handle it. Just then, they heard a sound from the boy. They both called Minchul, asking if it was him. He was writhing on the floor, and suddenly, he started screaming. Our boy thought he wished he could have gone further with him. Unfortunately, this was the result of the strategy. But then the fool put his hand on his head, saying it hurt like hell. Out of nowhere, our boy dropped his weapon and grabbed Minchul's face. It looked like he was about to hug him, but he just wanted to know if the guy hadn't been bitten. Minchul said no, he had killed that creature but slipped and hit his head. Now our boy hugged him, saying he thought he was dead. The chat commented that Chiamsu should check again, and Minchul realized that he didn't know our boy had this side. At that moment, he began to search Minchul thoroughly to make sure. Once confirmed, he hugged him again. Chiamsu said he was relieved that everything worked out in the end. Minchul then asked how they managed to get on the moving train. That's when Suiyan snapped back to reality and asked our boy how he managed to throw her in midair. Our boy told her not to say things like that, as it could cause a misunderstanding. However, she pointed out that he had been running with the train while carrying her on his back, and that it did make sense. He replied that he never knew he was that strong and had seemingly awakened some kind of power in the midst of danger. It's like those stories about a mother lifting a car to save her child. Suayan said she had heard many stories like that, but seeing something happen was truly incredible. At that moment, a sound started coming from the radio. Someone was asking the train to respond and asking who was there. She recognized it as Division 7.5 and asked Tianzu what they were going to do. The chat likely knew they were trying to contact the checkpoint and that no one was answering. Chiansu responded saying he was a passenger and the person asked for his identity. He just said he was a civilian. The person then asked if he had stopped at the checkpoint as ordered. Our boy tried to think of the right way to respond. He then said they had to fix the train along the way, and when they returned, they found the checkpoint personnel dealing with a massive horde. All the soldiers were trying to escape, but he was the only one who made it. The person questioned if he was really the only survivor. He said yes, adding that the engineer had started the train, but she was bitten and jumped off. So Ayan was about to tell him not to kill her off like that, but he just covered her mouth and asked what he should do and if those people were from Division 7.5. The person confirmed that they were, but still questioned if he was really the only survivor. Our boy started making a distorted voice, asking if they could hear him and said the signal was breaking up. The guy asked him to wait, but Chiansu said he'd meet them at the Dejan station. The guy said that was fine and that all Chiansu had to do was pull the brake and they would handle the rest. She praised our boy's ability to lie and he said now they knew they couldn't stop at that station in Dejan. She then asked if there was any place they could stay before reaching the city. She mentioned remembering a small forest before the main city. So off they went with our boy saying that this place looked more like a jungle. Chiansu asked if that pipe was useful and Minchil said yes. The guys mentioned that Chiansu seemed to like it, but it was time for him to get a decent weapon. What Chiansu noticed was odd was that the place was too quiet. There wasn't a sound from a single bird, just their footsteps in the midst of it all. Suddenly, he seemed to sense something strange. He asked if the others had heard something, and they said no. Then he asked the chat, and they said they only heard one sound. It seemed our boy was losing his mind because he was hearing something only he could hear. He asked Suyam how big the place was. She said they'd be out of there in about 20 minutes at most, but the darkness was a problem. Minkyul said he had memorized the map and would lead the way. Chiansu said it was always good to have him around. They continued moving forward until Chiansu suddenly shouted for Minkyul. The kid was almost attacked but managed to defend himself. Chiansu grabbed him by his backpack, telling him to get back. Strangely, it was a tree trunk that had attacked. Chiansu asked if that wasn't a bit too much for them. People on the live stream recognized it as the cruel tree. Our boy asked what that meant, and they said it was basically an army of monsters. Another one attacked the ground, with a branch coming their way. Suyan managed to defend them. Chiansu noted that the attacks were fast, but their movements were slow, so they had to flee. Minchil understood and said he'd take the fastest route. They followed the side route, but after running a bit, they encountered another cruel tree. Minchil changed direction again. Chiansu was confident they could escape them, but there was an attack coming from behind. He dodged it, but someone got thrown far away. 
Our boy fell flat on his face like a fool and Suyun was scared. That tree was much bigger than the others and had separated them from Minchiel. The poor guy had to get up immediately, and Chiemsu shouted that they would meet him at the entrance. Minchiel said he understood, but there was a problem. And then he got hit. Brave as he was, he told Chiemsu to run. He managed to get out of the way and started fleeing, saying it was best if everyone made it out alive. Suyan and Chiansu were trying to find a way out, and she wanted to know why they were being surrounded like that. The strangest thing was that Chiansu's aggro ability wasn't activating. It was then explained that it was because the trees weren't targeting him. They didn't have eyes or ears. Chiansu kicked one of them and finally the first aggro activated. He told Suyan to stop hitting them because those monsters only sensed them through contact. She realized that hitting them put them at a disadvantage. He grabbed her arm and said they would have to run and circle around them to pass. He hoped that Minchiel had made it out alive. Minchiel was now approaching the entrance. The trees seemed to stop when there was no more soil. Now the problem was where Chiansu was and what he should do until they arrived. He knew it was dangerous to go back, but he remembered the hug. Chiansu had told him to wait at the entrance, but it seemed Minchiel had an idea because he headed to the convenience store, praying that no one was inside. He grabbed some beers and some towels. A left turn, and you can imagine what he was going to do. The next scene showed him setting things on fire and running through the forest, looking for Chiansu. He went to the trees that didn't react and set them ablaze. As soon as they started burning, they ran. He grew more confident, saying they didn't seem so tough now. Someone called Greenpeace because the kid set everything on fire and he wasn't stopping. The trees were running around in a panic, and as they became weaker, dodging them became easier. Strangely, one of them exploded out of nowhere, and he was confused as to why that happened. Then he realized that they were all entering some kind of combustion form. They kept chasing and he ran away, shouting to keep a distance, but he tripped and fell on the ground like a fool until someone seemed to throw a bucket of water. With that, the trees were extinguished. He wondered why they stopped and someone warned that they were going to explode. It was the old man who told the boy to take the chance to run. As he began to stand up, the tree exploded. The old man grabbed Minchul's arm and told him they needed to get out of there. Minchul tried to explain that he had friends he was waiting for, but the old man told him to forget about them and asked if he couldn't see those creatures. He pulled Minchul onto a path, saying it was the only way to leave this place. However, Minchul found it strange. He hadn't seen anything like this on the map. Suddenly, the old man stopped and lifted the cover of a manhole. Before Minchul could say anything, he was pushed down. The boy was thrown down there. As he began to get up, the old man was climbing down. Minchul asked where they were, but the old man wanted to know if Minchul was okay. He replied that aside from all the pain he was feeling, he was fine. The old man placed him on a bed and told him to rest a bit. He explained that this place was his home and that he had been building it since before everything started. With a strange look, the old man noticed something. He asked if Minchul had been in school because he was wearing a uniform. Minchul said yes, but that didn't matter much these days. He stood up, saying he had a friend to help, but immediately fell back onto the bed with pain in his ribs. The old man told him to give up. Once these creatures start following someone, they always end up dead. Minchul insisted that he was going to save his friends, but the old man yelled that he wasn't going anywhere. If he wanted to save his friends, he should wait until sunrise because then the creatures wouldn't be able to move. Minchul thought that was too risky, but the old man tried to convince him, saying that going out now was suicide. Besides, it was already late, so it would soon be morning. Minchul said that maybe waiting a bit wouldn't be so bad. At that exact moment, they heard footsteps above them. The old man told him to relax. The creatures couldn't enter here. He grabbed a can of peaches and told him to eat some. The boy hesitated. However, the old man took his hand, gave him a spoon, and told him to eat up. Otherwise, he wouldn't recover. He would eat energy if he wanted to save his friends tomorrow. All innocent, Minchul ate and said it was really good. The old man handed him some water, saying he must be suffering a lot for someone so young. He could take as long as he wanted. The old man didn't seem suspicious at all. The old man then asked how Minchul had gotten there, and Minchul explained that he was on the other side of the forest. The old man then asked if he had come by train. Minchul said yes, and the man asked how many of them were there. He said three, including himself. The old man then commented that only two were left. This old man's interrogation wasn't over. He wanted to know what Minchul had in his backpack. Minchul said it was nothing special, just food and some other things. However, he didn't want anything since the old man had already helped him a lot and even given him a safe place. The old man told him not to worry and said he could even sleep on that mattress. He turned on the light and told him to go to sleep. They would talk in the morning. Minchul lay down, but he was so anxious that he couldn't fall asleep. He found the old man's preparation incredible. Perhaps his calmness came from the experience that comes with age. He felt bad for suspecting the old man who had only shared food and been so kind. 
The trees continued stomping above as Minchul thought of Chiansu. He knew his friend must be busy running around with nothing to eat or drink, but those peaches had tasted so good. That's when he started imagining his friends as monsters, dying of thirst and hunger. He looked to the side and saw a bunch of peach cans. He called out to the old man and thought that maybe taking just one wouldn't be so bad, considering how many there were. At that moment, he touched the can, but then reconsidered, thinking it wasn't right to take it from someone who had saved him. He decided to put it back and try to sleep. The old man, of course, was just listening to everything. Outside, Kiansu couldn't understand why there were so many of those creatures. Worse, every time one moved, others woke up, and soon the whole forest was in motion. Suein apologized, saying she had lost her weapon when she was attacked. Kiansu asked if she was hurt. She said no and asked how they were going to get out of there. The problem was that they had been running for so long they didn't even know where they were anymore. The chat said they knew this place was dangerous, and someone else suggested he find an axe. Our boy said it was obvious he wouldn't find something like that right now. But then he noticed something strange. A single tree was heading in the other direction. That's when he saw a teddy bear hanging from a branch. It was even waving at him. Our boy knew that damn thing was asking to be followed. Suyan asked what the problem was. He immediately grabbed her arm and told her to come along. She wondered if he suddenly remembered the way out. The little bear jumped and he told them to follow, but she had no idea what he was talking about. The damn bear was running fast, but our boy had 37 coins. Whatever was there, he was going to open it. He shouted at the bear to stop because he wanted to open the chests. But suddenly, his expression changed. The chest he found cost 72 zens. The chat laughed, saying he was broke. The poor guy went crazy, shouting that the first one cost one, the second five, so why was this one 72? The chat explained that the value was related to what was inside the chest. He started to panic as Suyan asked what was wrong. He said he needed that support chest. She asked what he was talking about, clearly not seeing what he was seeing. She started to think he had lost his mind and told him to snap out of it, saying they would soon find a way out. She grabbed his hand and ran, saying the creatures were getting closer. He tried to decide whether to grab everyone and get stronger or try something else, but the risk of death was much higher. He kept thinking about how to deal with a bunch of monster trees, and that's when he got the idea to use fire. However, at that moment, a jet of water sprayed out, drenching the trees. Suyan was confused about why this was happening, and then another guy nearby said he'd help them and told them to go that way. Suyan pulled Chiansu, who wondered why someone was there, but even though it was risky, it was their only option. The guy told him to follow as he was heading to a shelter. Meanwhile, Minchiol was feeling something strange. His head was spinning and his body felt heavy. The old man noticed he was struggling, but said there was plenty of time until sunrise. Minchiol told him he felt strange, too tired and unable to get up. The old man said it was normal to feel tired late at night and that he shouldn't worry. He just needed to sleep and the old man would keep an eye on him. Minchiol began to suspect something. The old man got up from the bed, saying he was impressed Minchiol had resisted the effects, but that he just needed to sleep and by morning, it would all be over. The poor boy asked what would be over and what the old man was planning to do. The old man said Minchul's exhaustion would be gone and he'd feel much better. Minchul asked what he had done and the man replied that he had saved him. Minchul argued that if that were true, he wouldn't feel this way. The old man explained that it was happening because he touched that can pointing out that it was covered in a certain substance. Minchul tried to get up, noticing it was strangely sticky. The old man revealed that the can was coated in poison made from the leaves of those monsters. Minchiel began collapsing to the floor and the old man explained that the poison was easily absorbed through the skin and that Minchiel should rest or he would just hurt himself more. The old man scolded him to relax or he'd get sick and said they would talk after Minchiel woke up. Minchiel struggled to stay conscious, trying to get up to warn everyone, but it was too late. He drifted off and the old man said he'd see him in the morning. Kianansu then asked what kind of bunker this was. The guy told him not to dawdle because the monsters were coming and to get down quickly. But Chiansu insisted that the guy go first. The guy refused and told him to go down because they didn't have time. But Chiansu said he wouldn't go unless the guy went first. The guy relented and told him to shut the door. Kianansu descended, feeling suspicious. Down below, the guy said they barely made it. The first thing Chiansu noticed was the shelf full of books. The guy introduced himself as Gizang Yu. Suiyan introduced herself, but Chiansu cut her off saying his name was Chiansugo. The guy greeted them and said it was a pleasure to meet them. After a while, Suyan asked if he lived alone and he said yes, so they could relax. She then turned to Chiansu and asked for some water. The guy went to the cabinet and said they could take one, so they wouldn't have to use their own. However, Chiansu said he didn't want to cause any more trouble and declined. The guy closed it and said it was fine, and if they needed water, they could just ask him. Suyan questioned him because it all seemed very suspicious to her. He agreed and said it was also weird for him, which is why he was being cautious. He asked if they would be able to leave in the morning. The guy said yes, and that it would be safe since the monsters don't move around at that time. Suyan, being a bit shameless, asked for the bed for herself. Before Chiansu could say yes, she was already asleep on it. However, he noticed that she was acting deliberately, as if she was carefree. And that was the best strategy. He decided to follow the same plan, knowing that things weren't going to go well there. 
Suddenly, he began to open his eyes, and the chat wanted to know what was going on. Were they about to see the guy crush his skull? People started spamming messages telling him to wake up quickly, and the guy was getting closer. Then Chien Su opened his eyes and asked what he was doing. The guy was startled and said he was just coming to put a blanket on him because he looked cold. The people in the chat started laughing saying the guy got scared of a blanket. The guy also handed him a pillow, saying that the floor in that place was pretty hard. Kian Su thanked him and lay back on the ground. It was hard to stay awake because it had been a while since he last laid in a bed. All he wanted was to know how Minchul was doing. The chat told him not to fall asleep. He said he wouldn't, but then people commented about the drool. All he wanted was to be able to enjoy sleep like Sueon seemed to be enjoying it. He figured he could only stay awake because of his stats. If that was the case, he was forced to stay conscious here until she woke up. Sometime later, the place was completely silent. Kian Su stood up, saying that the bastard had finally fallen asleep. Kian Su asked the chat what to do, and they said he seemed cautious. The place was well prepared, no wonder this guy had survived for so long. The question remained, why would someone who knew the area so well go out at night when the trees were moving? He needed to learn more about this guy and he couldn't see any cameras around. Not to mention he had a lot of those peach cans, so our boy reached out to grab one. He noticed that each can had a different logo on it. He figured some of them probably contained something off. The chat warned him to be careful because the crazy guy would wake up soon. Kiemsu approached the man's body, which suddenly woke up in shock. Our boy had already immobilized him, and the man asked what he thought he was doing. Chienzu replied that he was the one who wanted answers since the man reacted before he even touched him. Jizun kept begging to be released and Suiyan began to wake up. Chienzu immediately told her to bring a blanket because they were going to restrain the guy. She said she knew something like this would happen. Chienzu asked how she was so sure, considering she was the first to fall asleep. She replied that she slept because she felt safe knowing Kiansu had said he would handle everything. They tied him up and the chat suggested binding him to the staircase to prevent him from escaping. The man who had helped them was completely restrained and asked what they were doing. Kiansu told him to stay there for a while and then he could enjoy the bed again. The man asked Suian for help, saying this was ridiculous, but she replied that it was a shame and you have to spend the night tied up. The man was seething with anger at those brats, but he eventually fell asleep too. Now our boy was completely knocked out and Suian had fallen asleep again. Until she heard a beeping sound, she woke Chiansu up, asking what that noise was. She noticed he had set an alarm for 7 in the morning right after falling asleep. Hizun asked to be untied now that they had both had a good night's sleep. Suayan agreed it had been a wonderful night, and she couldn't hear anything outside. She tried waking Chiansu up, telling him to get up, but our boy wasn't moving. She kept insisting, asking what was going on, but he was completely unresponsive. She asked Gizong what he had done, but he said he was tied up and couldn't have done anything. She insisted that he better explain because something had clearly happened. The man said maybe Chiansu was just a heavy sleeper. She said she was sure he had done something. The man asked how he could be accused when he hadn't even left his spot. She grabbed him by the neck, demanding answers. That's when he admitted that Chiansu had probably touched one of those cams without realizing it because it was too dark. He explained that he had coated the cams with poison, a trap for ungrateful thieves. Suian demanded the antidote, threatening to beat him to death, but he claimed he'd never heard of such a thing. He said he might remember if they untied him. She kicked him in the face. The man said she was more violent than he expected. She warned that if he didn't reveal the antidote, he'd die tied up. He replied that she didn't need to untie him. Suddenly, something started to burn on his back. She jumped back as the entire man was engulfed in flames, saying she should have checked his pockets because he always carried a lighter and wore flammable clothes. Suian asked if he lost his mind. He said no, he was just starting to have fun. Suian ran to Chiansu and grabbed his blanket, using it to try and put out the flames. But the place was filling with smoke. She ran to the bathroom, grabbed a hose, and managed to put the fire out. However, now the guy had broken free from his restraints. He was alive and elbowing his way forward. He pinned her against the wall and said it was her turn to try to escape. But she landed a kick right between his legs, telling the fool to get off her. He writhed in pain and she started coughing. The air was unbreathable, and she couldn't even see Chiansu. Then she heard something behind her. Jizong was already on top of her with a mask, knocking her to the ground and telling her it was her turn to die. She tried to stretch her arm toward a can, but unfortunately, she fell, and he told her not to play with food. He said he would thank the two of them for showing up because he needed some fertilizer. She asked what he meant, and he said they wouldn't be leaving because they had harmed his precious trees. If he had been burned to death, he would also be used as fertilizer, something even that old man would probably do. Suian realized that this guy was a total lunatic, and there was no dealing with him. If she lost consciousness now, it would be the end of everything. Suian screamed for Chiansu again. The man told her to stop yelling, saying the poison Chiansu had touched would last at least another half day. She should go back to sleep, and that way her death would be less painful. With that, Suian lost consciousness until she suddenly felt the sunlight. Chiansu got open the entrance, saying that now the place was much better, and he would flash a confident smile. Hyujin asked how that was possible. Chiansu descended, asking why he had burned that ladder. Now when he and Suian tried to leave, he would have to jump. 
The man said first of all, a jump that high did make sense, and secondly, how was Chiansu already awake? Chiansu admitted the poison was dangerous, and he had almost died. But he put that aside and said it was time for Gizon to pay for his favor. Chiansu grabbed Gizon's arm and twisted it. The man swung to punch him, demanding to be released. But Chiansu caught him and said that his live stream viewers wouldn't like seeing their streamer beaten up. The guy was confused, asking what he was talking about, and Chiansu simply replied that his body was different from other people's, which was why he could jump like that. The mask was lying on the ground and Gizon was already grabbed by the neck, with Chiansu asking, it was hard to breathe. Gizon tried to bite him and Chiansu asked if he was cosplaying as a zombie, but then Gizon hit him in the face with a can, followed by a punch. The Eddie collapsed to the ground and Suyan started stomping on him, telling him to die already. Chiansu grabbed her hand and said that was enough. He began washing her hands, saying she had made a mess by touching those cans. She retorted that he was the one who had been asleep, but he reminded her that he was also the one who woke up and saved the day. She blushed, feeling embarrassed, but also sweet. Kiansu then got closer and said they needed to do something to make sure this guy couldn't escape. He twisted Gizyong's foot, who woke up and asked him to wait. Kiansu asked what the problem was since he had set himself on fire. Suddenly, Gizyong started shouting for his grandfather's help. The two of them were confused. Who was this grandfather? Chiansu told him that now he had to reveal who else was there with him. The scene shifted to someone digging. The shovel hit the ground and the old man said it had been a great day. He just wondered why Dizion was taking so long. Minchul was the poor soul who was about to become plant food. When the old man saw Minchul waking up, he said he liked young people full of energy. Minchul was barely conscious, trying to understand what was going on. The old man asked if he had slept well, and when Minchul realized he was in the middle of a pit, he begged to be let out. However, the old man said that wasn't possible. Unfortunately, Minchul would have to become fertilizer. He told Minchul not to move because the trees only move their roots during the day to absorb nutrients. Minchul wondered if he was the nutrients and cursed the man. The old man said that's why he preferred plants. They were never rude. If you gave them nutrients, they grew. If you stopped, they died. Minchul tried to escape, but the old man struck his shoulder. It hurt and Minchul fell back into the pit with the old man telling him to conserve his energy and not worry because becoming fertilizer was like being reborn as something new. Of course, Minchil started kicking the roots, yelling at them to get away. He told the old man that he had lived long enough and should be the one to become fertilizer. The old man said Minchil was truly impolite and tried to hit him with the shovel again. However, Minchil took advantage of the situation, turning just in time. The shovel hit his hand, but at least cut the rope, freeing him. He grabbed the shovel and threatened to kill the old man, pulling him into the pit. Now the old man fell face first into the dirt, and Minchiel asked him if he found this fun. The old man, shivering, called him a bastard. Minchiel told him to hurry up and reveal who else was in that place and where his friends were. The old man smiled, saying his grandson was taking care of things, though he had no idea when it happened. Minchiel was confused. He hadn't expected there to be more than one person. That's when the old man grabbed a rock and threw it, hitting Minchiel squarely on the shoulder. While Minchiel writhed in pain, the old man took the opportunity to go for the shovel. However, despite being in immense pain, Minchul managed to kick the old man hard in the ribs. He grabbed the shovel and landed a hit right in the old man's stomach, causing him to collapse to the ground, crushed. The old man begged for his life, saying that if Minchul killed him, he would never see his friends again. But Minchul only wanted to know where they were. The old man explained that it was a complex path and that Minchul would never remember it. Minchul replied that he didn't care and told him to reveal the way. Fearing for his life, the old man said they were in the northwest part near the entrance gate. If Minchul took him, everyone could stay alive. It wasn't good for a young man to dirty his hands with blood. But Minchul simply raised his arms and said it was a shame. He was already old enough to do whatever he wanted. The old man warned that without him, Minchul would know the path. But Minchul just smiled, saying he had memorized the layout of this place a long time ago. And then he struck the old man square in the head. Back with Chiansu, he was calling out to his friends, standing before the chest. He complained that it cost 72. The people in the live stream asked what he wanted. Was he asking for points? He lamented and cried, repeating that it was 72. His live stream friends told him that whining wouldn't change anything. He insisted that with 72, there had to be something incredible inside and they had to see it together. However, Oscar wasn't buying it and told him to stop with the dumb strategies and just find Minchul already. But Chiansa put his hands on the chest and tried to yank it out of the ground. Oscar laughed, telling him to give up. It was impossible to move it. Chiansu felt defeated. The thing seemed stuck forever. He stared at it, thinking maybe with an excavator, he could get it out. Then someone in the chat suggested spinning the roulette. It would determine whether he could win by using his zen. He was upset about not being able to take the massive chest. That's when only one asked if he really wanted it. If he was serious, only one could lend him the money, but he would take it back after the winnings. Chiansu asked if he was really going to lend him the money. Only one said yes, but only this once and that Chiansu would have to remember it because he truly regret it in the future. Chiansu agreed and only one isolated authority and lent him 35 zen. 
Suddenly, Suyun screamed, asking where he had gone. He approached with an axe over his shoulder, saying he was looking for a weapon to save Minchiel. Now that he was ready, it was time to go. Elsewhere, someone was crawling out of a pit, poor Minchiel, beaten up, while the old man was turning into nutrients. A while later, the two were startled when they found Minchiel passed out and severely injured again. Worse, he had left a trail of blood behind him. Chiansu picked him up, saying he must have fainted from blood loss. Suyan suggested heading to the city entrance, where there might be a pharmacy. But on the way, they found a warehouse. Our boy pulled out his 72-point axe and slashed at the lock, but it didn't cut, startling him. He struck again, and the number two appeared. With that, the door finally opened. She asked what that was for, and he told her to throw him in. So poor Minchiel was loaded onto the cart. Later, they found the hospital in that part of the city. For better or worse, it was empty. He asked what they should do with the boy. Suyan suggested stitching his wounds and giving him some medicine. He rummaged through the cabinets and said, unfortunately, there was nothing. It seemed everything had already been looted. He told her to take care of Minkyul while he searched other rooms. Kiansu began walking through the hallways until he heard something strange. He asked the live stream if they had heard it too, and they said they had a bad feeling. Kiansu was afraid it might be another kind of villain, putting Minchil's life in even greater danger. He returned to the room and said it was better for them to leave. Suyan asked if something had happened, and he explained that he had a bad feeling about the place, as if something was watching them from behind the door. A purple-haired woman appeared, and Suyan warned him to be careful. The woman said she was interested in the smell of blood. Kiansu pointed his axe at her, telling her that if she didn't want to get cut, she should step away from the door. But she entered fearlessly, saying she couldn't let that happen. She got in Chiansu's face and said his friend would die if he did that. She asked if that was what he wanted because, given the shock Minchil had experienced from blood loss, that's what would happen. Suyan told Chiansu they should leave. Something was wrong with this woman. She replied that it wasn't just something wrong, she was completely wrong. Suyan told her to back off and ask what was up with the crazy woman. The woman showed an ID card with the name Harion Kim from the Department of Nursing. The chat recognized her as someone in her fourth year. Chiansu was thrilled to find someone who could help heal. However, the chat warned him to be careful. She might be support or she might be a villain. Harry Allen was in a frenzy, asking if he wanted his friend to die or live, warning that if they had really compressed his situation with medication, he could choke on it. Chiansu had no idea what to do, and the chat was saying that this woman was crazy, and they were scared. However, Harry Allen was smiling, saying that she would love for him to stay alive. She finally found a patient who was alive, and all she wanted was for him to stay that way. For a moment, Chiansu seemed touched. As crazy as she was, her gaze seemed sincere. A while later, Minchil was waking up, and an old man was in his face, striking him with a shovel. It seemed like the boy was trapped in a nightmare, falling into a pit and being absorbed, desperately screaming for help. Finally, he woke up in the hospital, frightened. He looked to his side and saw Soyeon and Chiansu. The people in the live chat praised the doctor, saying her support skills were incredible. Chiansu said Minchiul almost died from blood loss. Suyan explained that he had been asleep for more than half a day. The boy was emotional and even the chat was tearing up. He got up and asked what happened to the old man. Chiansu explained that he found the guy dead when he reached him. Minchiul then asked who that crazy girl behind him was. At that moment, she stepped forward and introduced herself as Harry Ong, saying that she was the one who saved him and that he should be grateful. Minchiul, feeling awkward, thanked her and she seemed genuinely happy. Chiansu thought her skills weren't bad, and maybe they should bring her along. The problem was that with her personality, you could never tell how she'd react in tough situations. So he said that now that Minchul was awake, they should leave. On their way out, Chiansu knelt and told Minchul to hop on his back, or maybe he wanted to be carried in the cart again. Then he turned to Harry Ong and said it was a brief encounter, but he wanted to thank her. Suyan so handed her some supplies. The three of them started walking away, with Chiansu complaining that carrying Minchul was tough. Meanwhile, Harry Ong was left behind in the hospital. Suya noted that the strangest thing about the city was that they hadn't seen a single zombie yet. Chiansu said it was weird, but they should always stay on guard. Minchiel then said he was tired of being carried and preferred to walk. Chiansu helped him up and Suya asked if they were hungry. Since there was still gas, they could probably use the stove. They entered a shop that seemed untouched. Finally, it was a place with no bodies on the ground. Minchiel said he checked to see if there were any supplies, but Chiansu warned him not to do that because the fridge wasn't running, meaning everything inside would have gone bad a long time ago. Minchul let go of the door handle and said he understood. Suyan said she found two packs of instant noodles, some seasonings, and a water purifier. Chiansu said that if they found those, there might be more, so he would look around. The chat told him to go back and open that fridge because there might be some terrifying water inside. He said if they wanted, they could donate some zen, and he would open it. The chatters responded that it was his fault for owing so much. Luckily, the area still had plenty of supplies, though the ready-made meals were all spoiled. Kiansu said it was enough and decided it was time to head back. However, he noticed something strange, a creature staring at him from the door. He asked the chat why they weren't watching his back. He then approached Harry Ong and asked if she was following them. He opened the door and told her to come in, asking why she was following them when he had already paid her for the help she gave. 
Feeling embarrassed, she admitted that she knew that but was worried her patient might reopen his wounds and she would have to treat him again. Maybe something like that could happen. She explained that she wanted to stay close to them until he fully recovered. She answer told her that if that was the case, she should have asked Minchiel and not him. And if she was talking to the leader, maybe she wanted to join the group, didn't she? She answer noticed she was flustered. Maybe this was her real personality. Perhaps she only acted confident and crazy when she was taking care of someone. Plus, she was probably alone in this place because she had been abandoned. He then got in her face and said it was fine, but he would set a condition. In the next scene, he returned with a bunch of supplies, saying he would cook and told Suyan to heat up the pan. Suyan said she couldn't believe it, but Chiyansu told her he would show her the experience of living alone for a long time. The chat joked, asking if it was a rare Chiyansu mukbang, but there he was starting to cook. He set a mental limit of 30 minutes, handling the spatula delicately. Suyan had burgers on the skillet, along with some vegetables. He tossed in the instant noodles. When it came to preparing ready-to-eat food, he was a pro. All he had to do was throw everything in the pan and heat it the right way. Chiansu was the convenience store chef. Minchul was praising him, saying that the boy was truly a chef, and the food was really good. Even Suyan admitted that it wasn't as bad as she expected. With that, they started eating. But Chiansu seemed rushed. Suyan asked why he was in such a hurry, considering it was the apocalypse. He put down his chopsticks and thanked them for the meal. Minchul told him he should drink something or else he'd choke. But Chiansu just put on his jacket and told Suyan that sometimes he would do strange things, but she'd have to trust him. Confused, she asked what he was talking about and he just told them to eat slowly. He'd be back soon. Walking through the city, the chat asked if Haryang was still there. Indeed, she was abandoned in front of the shop. When he called out to her, she jumped in surprise and seemed excited, immediately running over, saying he had kept his promise. What he had done was tell her to stay put for 30 minutes and not go anywhere. This was just to make sure she could follow instructions. Embarrassed, she admitted she was nervous, thinking she had been abandoned. But in the end, she believed in him. He heard a strange sound and stepped closer to check her ID, but she said there was no need. That's when Chiansu noticed something odd. The number zero seemed to have been added. She then confessed that she had only studied for two years. She put the zero on when soldiers came because they said they were only taking people from higher classes. Unfortunately, there wasn't enough space in the vehicle, so in the end, it didn't matter. That's why she no longer needed it. Chiansu returned the ID saying that it was still hers in the end and she didn't have to worry anymore because she would be traveling with them. She lit up with excitement, saying that although she hadn't studied much, she had plenty of practical experience. He just told them to get moving. She asked if she could call him Mr. Chiansu. Taken aback, Chiansu's hair stood on end. He said he had never been called that before. The chat joked, asking if he would soon be called Master. In the next scene, the two of them were in shock as Haryang cheerfully said she was excited to travel with everyone. Suyan seemed confused and asked Chiansu if he was sure about this. He replied that Harry Ong had helped them and seemed to have some problems. It looked like she'd been abandoned by her previous group. They both immediately understood why she was alone. She answer explained that this was one of those moments when he would do things she wouldn't understand. She would just have to trust him and accept Harry Ong as part of the team. Minchil responded that if that was the case, he trusted her. Not only had she saved him, but he was also sure Chien Su wouldn't bring her along without a reason. He looked at Sui An and said it was the best option. She said she wouldn't be the odd one out, and if everyone had reached a consensus, then that was that. Chien Su then told everyone to pay attention. Harry Yang had explained that the trees were everywhere in the region, which was why there were no zombies around. They were probably consuming everything. Chien Su suggested they take a look. He struck the tree with his axe, and the number one appeared. People nearby noticed a liquid seeping out, but Chiansu was more interested in the numbers appearing with each cut. Another strike raised the number to two, and another took it to three. He realized it was some sort of hit counter. Suyan opened the door and told him to come in because she needed to talk about something. He was confused, especially since he had just gone out. Then the radio began playing a message. Someone announced that it was directed at all survivors up to that point, urging them to find the refugee camp they had set up. Chiansu immediately recognized it as Division 7.5. The message said not to go to any other points of interest scattered throughout the city. They would find ways to reach them at certain train stations and bus stops. The nation hadn't given up on them. Kiansu asked Suyan where she got the radio. She said it was already in the shop and she found it as soon as he went to the convenience store. Kiansu started to find it strange. How did these people have so much influence if they weren't really military? The chat warned him to be careful, saying Division 7.5 not only looked like a scary gang, but probably was one. Suyan asked what they were going to do. Kiansu asked if everyone had finished eating, it was time to head to the terminal. A while later, it was getting quite dark, and worse, it looked like it was going to rain. Kiansu told Suyan to explain why she seemed so worried. She said the terminal would definitely be dangerous, and asked if he had a plan. He said he did, but for now the goal was to find a car. With everyone hearing that message, sooner or later, someone would pass by. Haryang asked if he was planning to steal someone's car, saying she couldn't do something like that. Chiansu replied that she said these things, but when he found her, she didn't have the look of someone who obeys the law. 
She grabbed him from behind, insisting that she was telling the truth and that he needed to believe her. Minchidal said it was fine. They could look for an abandoned car instead. But first, they would check out Haryang's house. She pointed and said it was just around the corner, telling them to follow her. As they followed her, Hyunsu heard someone ask what kind of place this was. He quickly pulled Haryang by the collar, hiding behind a wall to take a peek. Three guys on the other side of the street were arguing about whether this was the right direction. One of them said they didn't have a choice and should keep going. The chat said those guys were making them nervous, and Chiansu agreed that it was better to wait before moving on. Even though they didn't know who those people were, it was best not to get involved. After observing for a while, it was time to continue. Finally, Haryang said they had arrived. This was where they would stay. Minchil, still traumatized, asked if she lived in the sewers. She could have a special cart to remove the cover, which she had taken from a construction site. Chiansu was impressed by how prepared she was. But now, with the cover off, he asked what they were going to do next. Suddenly, they heard footsteps. The trees were beginning to approach the city. With no time to waste, everyone started descending. As they went down, her flashlight illuminated a branch stuck in the pipe. Chiansu asked what that was, and the chat said she was creating a monster. However, the plant moved toward the cover, pulled it shut, and sealed them all inside. She explained that it was a root of the tree monster. When exposed to light, it tries to block the sun's direction. They likely always think they can only grow underground. The three were amazed, and she asked if something was wrong. Chiansu said no, she was a genius. Inside, Minchil asked if she had figured that out on her own. She said it was no big deal, just some things she learned while scavenging for food at various markets. Chiansu found several notes she had made about the cruel trees, and even Soyan commented that she loved the decorations. On top of that, she had multiple extra beds. Haryong said it felt strange, almost like having visitors at home. She never thought something like that would happen in these times. They were all excited. Not only was the place well ventilated for a sewer, but they also had a place to sleep. Chiansu put a hand on Minchul's shoulder, knocked him down, and told him to rest a bit more. He then told everyone to grab a bed and get some sleep because tomorrow would be a long day. The four of them went to sleep with Chiansu thinking that today had been wild, but then again, all the days had been like this. He told the chat to wake him up if anything suspicious happened. The chat told him to handle it and stop being lazy. Another person joked that they were dreaming. He replied that he was waiting until suddenly someone was calling his name, telling him to wake up and that he was going to waste all his money. He recognized the voice as a woman's, but when he looked around, he saw the two girls sleeping and wondered if he was dreaming. Then he heard a noise nearby. The branch from before was clinging to the pipe. The chat commented that it took him forever to wake up considering the noise. Kiansu asked why they didn't try harder to wake him and someone said they did, even spending a lot of zen just to use the communication function. Kiansu asked if the voice in his dream was theirs. They explained that the voice function had been added while he was sleeping. Kiansu wondered why the game had secret updates. He went to talk to Harry Yang, who was sleeping face down on the floor. She turned to him, monstrous looking, and asked what Mr. Chiansu wanted. He told her to deal with the plant breaking through the pipe. She explained that it was normal. The thing was sensing the water flowing through and wanted to make contact. Kiansu asked what would happen if it rained. She said it would need a lot of water, so he didn't need to worry. She asked if that was all, then went back to sleep with her face on the floor. Outside, or rather inside, it seemed. It was raining heavily and Chiansu was getting soaked. The chat was spamming messages again, telling him to wake up and check out the disaster happening around him. He realized that the water level had risen significantly, and he hadn't even slept that long. Seeing that it was all coming from the ventilation system, he told everyone to wake up. Slowly, they got up and Suyan asked what was happening. Chiansu told them to grab their stuff quickly so they could get out. He revealed that what was above them wasn't just pipes, but a water tank that was nearly full. Suyan asked what they would do once they got outside. Chiansu turned to the chat and asked if they knew how these cruel trees reacted to rain. Some said the trees would stay still, while others claimed they would go wild. Haryan handed out some raincoats. Chiansu wasn't sure what to do. Outside, it was full of monsters, and inside, they were about to be submerged. It hadn't been long, and the water was already reaching Minchil's knees. He warned everyone to get ready. They were going to have to escape. Someone in the chat mentioned that this might not be an ordinary rain. There was a creature that could affect the environment around it. Maybe that was the case this time. Chiansu picked up a rock from the ground and threw it into the water. Nothing seemed to stir, but then an eye appeared from below. Minchil asked if it was just him, or was that a crocodile? Chiansu asked his chat what that thing was and they replied that it was El Croco, a creature that only appears in places with high water levels. Above them, Haryang said she couldn't get the exit open. Chiansu immediately knew what was happening. There was a tree blocking it from above. The chat told him he would have to face that creature head on, but Chiansu was trying to think of a way to get out of this situation. He then asked Haryang if the trees grew rapidly when they absorbed a lot of water. She confirmed that they did, but it had to be a large quantity. Chiansu said he understood. He raised his axe and told everyone to stay away from the stairs. He then makes a cut on the trunk and it comes into contact with the water, and at that moment, he hesitates to see what will happen. The place remains silent and the people in the chat laugh as it seems the plan didn't work. 
He then asks Harry Young if she's sure it would grow, and she says probably, but she had never given it so much water before. Suddenly, the water starts to get murky, and at that moment, a branch shoots out from it and begins hitting all the walls. Kinnisu gets excited, saying the counterattack had been a success. The best way to defeat a monster was by using another one. Although the alligator was fighting well, the tree kept growing and absorbing water. With so much available, the little creature didn't stand a chance. However, Minchil asked if he was sure about that. The creature seemed to have died after a while, and the people in the chat commented that it had grown too big, and now he would have to run. The tentacle was still trembling on the ground. Kanansu started to gather his courage, and then he said he knew there was something special about that axe. He started to descend, saying it was time to chop some wood. The chat got excited, saying it was now time for him to show what he was capable of. His friends were startled as he jumped, and at that moment, the stream exploded with support, and several other viewers sent him a mission. He had to defeat that cruel tree using the axe to receive 20 coins, and without fear, he jumped into the water. The group asked if he was really going to face that thing, and Harry Ong said it was extremely dangerous. However, he just repeated that he was going to get some firewood and asked his friends to cheer for him. With that, he landed the first blow, hitting it dead on, and immediately the aggro was triggered. The axe seemed to have caused damage. However, he noticed something coming. Obviously, the tree reacted and merely hit him. Still, without hesitation, he landed another hit right in the middle of the trunk, and the sequence of attacks seemed to be working. That axe was indeed naturally strong. However, its secret ability was much more powerful. As the group watched, he kept hitting one blow after another until the trunk was in front of him. But on the seventh hit, the cut went through easily. The chat was giving tips on where the attacks were coming from, and with that, the eighth hit was made, then the ninth, and so the little axe kept cutting. On the tenth hit, the cut was strong enough to split in half. Suayan was impressed, and I don't know who's sending all these little hearts, and the chat said, that's the axe of ten. Our boy was sure that number was a count. It didn't matter where he hit, the number would go up, and when it finally reached the right one, the final attack created an explosive cutting power. However, he couldn't let his guard down, and Hike noticed that the tree had already absorbed almost all the water. However, it didn't matter how strong it was now, he just had to start the count again. And man, that's how another sequence of attacks went. He was already on 9 and told the guys on the live stream that the firewood was ready, delivering one more cut to the other part of the trunk. Minchiol couldn't believe it. The whole tree had been shredded, and man, Chiansu was excited and wouldn't stop chopping. After a desperate series of strikes, he finally collapsed on the ground, exhausted. However, the mission was completed, and he received the reward. Of course, he never wanted to do something like that again, but the others joked that it would be fun next time too. He then looked up and said everyone could come down, while the others were still impressed, and Harry Ong was a bit embarrassed. They came down and asked if he was sure it was dead, and she said not to touch something like that. However, Harry Ong was already eager to run some experiments. Our boy questioned how she could think of something like that after nearly dying. He then said it was probably already dawn, and since the rain had stopped, they could likely head outside. Sometime later, they were all standing in front of a store. It was one of those stores that sells a bit of everything. Minchiel went to grab some clothes and a backpack, and our boy took the opportunity to grab a baseball bat that was lying around. The chat was laughing when, suddenly, they all heard someone squaring. They hid to see what was going on. Outside, a man was angry, and another approached, saying those damn people had disappeared. With that, they ran off, saying that if they didn't find them, the leader would deal with them. Suyan was worried, wanting to know who those people were, and Chiansu knew they weren't the same as before. However, they seemed somewhat similar, and maybe they were part of the same group. That's when he noticed something strange. Minchil seemed frozen with fear. Heyam approached and asked what was wrong, even touching his face, but he wasn't responding. Then Suyan came over and told him to answer quickly, asking why he seemed so scared. He felt embarrassed and said nothing. Chiansu noticed that he was very anxious and said he would take a look around. Apparently, the guys had left, so it was a good time for them to leave as well. However, just as they opened the door, a man came running by. Chiansu was confused and desperate. The man came asking for help, but something happened. Chiansu was startled. He had been hit on the head with a bat, and the guy said he was the one causing all that trouble. At that moment, Chiansu's group stood face to face with that man who immediately told them to come closer. The chat was even joking, saying a wild bandit had been found. Chiansu just told everyone to get ready to run. He knew things would get bad if they mixed with those people. However, the man then asked if he had no Minchiel. Man, the poor guy had been recognized. Chiansu asked if he knew those people, but Minchiel seemed reluctant to respond. Chiansu told him to speak up already. The guy took a step forward, but Chiansu pointed to the axe and told him to stay still. They were leaving and it was better if they didn't take another step. The guy laughed, saying Chiansu was bold and asked why he didn't let him greet his old friend, whom he missed so much. Chiansu simply replied that he didn't seem to miss him that much and said goodbye. However, 
The man said it wasn't up to him to decide and asked if Minchio wasn't going to say anything. The poor guy seemed to retreat and didn't respond. Hinesu began to realize the situation was getting complicated, but he warned the guys that they would regret it if they didn't leave him alone. The man replied that they seemed full of themselves, but out of respect for old times with Minchio, he would give them a count from one to three. He then counted one, counted two, and on three, he charged at them. However, Chiyunsu deflected the attack, causing the guy to drop the bat, and in the same instant, he went for him. Man, Chiyunsu showed no mercy and knocked him out cold. The two lackeys beside him were startled and charged, but Chiyunsu wasn't a nice guy either. He went on to cut down everyone. The poor guys fell, beaten on the ground. The man said Chiyunsu would regret this, but our protagonist approached and told him to repeat that, landing a blow on his shoulder. The fool winced in pain and asked where he got the courage to say that, mentioning that for someone on the ground, he seemed very bold. The people in the chat joked, saying that lying there, he looked like one of those cleaning robots, and our boy replied that a cleaning robot was smarter than this fool. The guy got up and told him to shut up, but Chiyunsu responded that it seemed like he had nothing else to say. The guy, furious, said Chiyunsu had no idea what group he was messing with, and Chiyunsu asked if he had any idea who he was dealing with, because the fool should know he's the protagonist. Obviously, the extra couldn't handle that provocation, and he leaped forward, ready to meet his end. Chiyunsu easily dodged and gave him a blow to the heel, causing the idiot to fall flat on the ground. But the guys advanced, and the chat asked if he was going to keep going easy on them. Man, the fun was over, and he whipped a strike to the neck, causing the fool to fall on top of his friend like an idiot. Our boy sank the axe into him, telling them to stop swearing so much. And man, that weapon was drenched in blood. With that, he just walked away, leaving the place. On the ground, the bandit was writhing in pain, but when he saw Chiansu approaching, he begged him not to come any closer. However, our boy reminded him that he had been the one trying to stop them from leaving, so now asking them to leave was a bit ironic. Haryong seemed scared and started calling for him, but the other psycho, who despite being a doctor, didn't know if she should help someone like that, said it wasn't worth it since the guy was going to die anyway. The guy cursed and told Minchul to stop standing there doing nothing, saying they were friends and telling him to make those bastards stop. Hinatsu asked Minchul if he really knew these people, and he replied that they used to hang out together. At that moment, Chiansu was shocked, and Minchul explained that shortly after, he stopped hanging out with them as soon as he received support from the people around him. Chiansu said that groups like that don't let members leave, and Minchul explained that he had an uncle who worked in the police, which was why they didn't get involved. Our boy then said that now it all made sense, that's why they thought they could do something. The guy on the ground asked him to wait and talk about it, but our boy just asked if what Minchul said was true. The guy said yes, and after he left, they didn't bother him anymore. Our boy raised the axe and said it was good to know, and the guy screamed, afraid of dying. However, at that moment, someone asked if he was really going to kill this person. It's just me, and our boy said he should. She said he really should, but not before getting some information out of him. At that, our boy was shocked, thinking she was going to ask to save him. They then tied the guy to one of those trees that groans, begging to be saved. Our boy told him he better stay quiet before the roots woke up. He should know what happens when the trees grow. The guy said the sun had already risen, so he was probably safe. Our boy said he wasn't stupid, but he didn't know that the trees were still moving underground, and if he made too much noise, a vine could come out of the ground at any moment and pull him under. Not to mention they were attracted to the smell of blood, so he'd better start talking before he died. Obviously, all of this was a lie, but the guy was desperate, saying he didn't want to die and begging to be saved. Kiansu simply said that someone else had said the same thing. The guy asked who he was talking about, and our boy reminded him of the person he killed as soon as they found him. Desperate, the guy then revealed that the group's name was Black Tattoo, and they had more than 20 members. Our boy asked if they went around killing survivors. The guy said actually they had just stopped there to grab some parts for the truck and were heading to the safe zone. Chiansu slapped his face and thanked him for the information, and with that they walked away, leaving the guy struggling to be freed. Our boy said, the truth is, I almost forgot. You can't let a bad seed take root, and with that, the guy was cut down. Some time later, the other members arrived at the scene and saw what had happened. Their friend had been finished, and everyone was asking who had done that to him. One guy said it looked like he had run into another group of survivors, and they should report this to the boss. The other guy agreed, but said they first needed to find out who did this. Apparently, he had been tortured, but they didn't know who could have done something like that in this area. Then another guy came running, shouting that there were more bodies over there. When he arrived, he saw the two friends of the guy and the other one who had been killed by a blow to the head. They wondered if that group had done all this. One guy said he didn't think so, and the bodies wouldn't have been left like this. The problem now was that it would be a huge headache if the boss found out about all of this. He said the bodies were still warm, so these people could be far, and he ordered everyone to go hunt them down. Today would be a big funeral. The guy's name was saying Jinju, and Minchil said he had a giant scar on his face and was the captain of these people. He didn't know if he was still with them, but back when he was in the gang, he was the leader. Kim Su thought that if Green Hair was around, he probably still was too. Minchil explained that the gang members were very athletic and apologized for causing so much trouble. 
Our boy said he didn't need to worry, they would have caused trouble with or without him there. Minshul asked if he was sure, and our boy said of course, but his guys didn't seem to have good intentions. He then explained that the leader divided the group into a few patrols, with some who were good fighters and things like that. Our boy said those guys were probably from the patrol group, they were the ones doing the easier missions and probably gathering resources in the area. Our boy knew that if the group had 20 members, there were 17 left now. That's when the chat told him to take a look to his right. They found a truck, and something interesting had clearly happened there. He approached to take a look, and it seemed like something infected had been there. Harry Yong said all the parts had already been taken, there wasn't even a battery left, and that thing probably wouldn't start. Our boy wondered why those idiots had wrecked the perfect truck. Sue Ann said they were probably attacked by the infected and had to abandon it, only coming back to strip the parts. Our boy agreed, but thought it was strange that they took the parts and were now looking for ways to fix it. The chat said they were really dumb and probably had one-dimensional thinking. But then Chien Su told everyone to wait. He approached calmly, raising the axe and asked who was there. The poor guy, desperate, begged him not to hurt him. But Chien Su told him to explain why he was there before he got hit in the face. The guy explained that he had been in that truck and managed to survive when they were ambushed. Chien Su questioned why he was acting so suspicious, and our boy asked if he knew him. The guy said no, but the protagonist noticed he was wearing the same uniform as the guy who got hit in the head. Kneeling, he thanked him, saying that at least he wasn't crazy like those guys. He explained that they were just passing through the area, and the guys with the black tattoos seemed like they wanted to help. However, as soon as they got closer, they started bashing everyone's heads in. He then asked if by any chance she had seen a guy wearing a similar uniform. Our boy already knew the guy had no idea his friend was dead, but first told him to calm down and asked if he knew which direction the guys went. The guy said they went south. Hintz returned to him and said it was good to know. That way, they wouldn't run into them. Scared, the guy asked where they were going and what Chiansu was going to do. Our boy didn't seem to care about that. The guy then asked if they needed transport to head south, saying that if they went south, they would run into the guys with the black tattoo. He said the worst option was to go north since there was no way to get out of there alive without a car. At that moment, our boy asked what he was talking about and the guy explained about some creatures that looked like trees and were tearing apart all of his friends. If he tried to pass through, he would die and the only way to get out alive was with a car. The only people who survived that path had a car. The guy mentioned some sharp vines and Chiansu wasn't sure if it was related to the trees. The chat said they were like detectors, sort of like speed cameras, but they work the opposite way. They kill you if you move too slowly. Our boy asked if it wouldn't make more sense to kill the fast ones, but they told him to think of them as carnivorous plants. Now things were more complicated for him because the goal heading north was to find a car, but without one, they couldn't go north. He then asked if those creatures were only in that direction, and the guy said he wasn't sure, but the people he was with mentioned them surrounding the whole area. Our boy said that considering that, they wouldn't really have a way to go north. Minshul asked if he was sure about going south. Even though he was skilled, those guys were still very dangerous. Our boy said they were just a bunch of dumb thugs and together, they could defeat them. He was already planning to take them down so he didn't need to worry. The guy on the ground said he must be pretty amazing to have that much courage, and the chat was even praising him, saying he was trying to act cool. Seeing no other option, he asked the guy's name, who introduced himself as Yang Jun. Our boy said it was a pleasure to meet him and wished him all the luck in the world to survive. Yang, feeling isolated, asked if he could go with them, and the chat urged him to take Yang along. Our boy said he'd like to, but unfortunately, he couldn't. Pointing to his hand, the guy asked what he was talking about. Harry Yang noticed something on his hand, and Chien Su said that it probably wasn't just a regular scratch. The guy said not to worry, it was just a small cut he got during the fight. However, Harry Yang was sure it was infected. Our boy explained that she was a doctor, so she probably knew what she was talking about. Desperate, Yang begged for help, saying they needed to cut off his arm to stop the infection. Scared, our boy asked what he was talking about, and Harry Yang explained that he would likely die from losing his arm because they would have to create a huge wound. The poor guy was already stuck, and she said that with such a big wound, the chances of him getting infected again would only increase. Besides, they didn't have any anesthetics, and if he went into shock, they wouldn't have time to wait for him. He would need to be absolutely sure he wanted to try this. Our boy told her to stop scaring the poor guy, and she apologized but said he needed to know what he was getting into. Chinansu said he would help him with it, but he needed to remember that he had already been infected for some time, and maybe this wouldn't do any good. But the guy said he didn't care, he'd do anything for a chance to live. This was all because of those bastards, and they refused to die like this. Chiansu started to think this was all too realistic, but they really be NPCs. He then asked Harry on to disinfect his axe, and she said okay. At that moment, our boy asked for help from the guys, asking them to give him a mission that after cutting off the guy's arm, he would stay alive for a while. The chat started joking, saying that was a lot to ask and wondering if he was going to take him along. Others said he should have already unlocked fun things and asked where the shopping was. But then a lunatic from the chat gave a new mission. He had to cut it off in five hits, no matter what. The reward was that the guy would be able to move freely without feeling any pain for an hour. 
The lunatic's name really fit. Harry Young then handed him the axe, and he told her she probably knew what to do. With that, she covered the guy's eyes. He asked what she was doing and told her to hold his arm. Actually, she apologized and thought he was scared to see it. The chat said she was cute. She also started to get ready. He only had five hits to cut that thing off. He thought it would be impossible to do it all in one blow. And the chat said the mission was kind of gross. But he warned them. And then he swung the first hit. The scream echoed and everyone got a little uncomfortable. Another scream came and the guy was desperate. Stu Aeon said he should be thankful they got to stay outside and didn't have to watch this scene. He was just listening to the strikes, saying it was true, but she found it strange. It was taking a long time for this to end. Some time later, the sounds finally stopped and the door opened. The psycho said they could come in. The poor guy was unconscious on the bed, and our boy was cleaning the axe. Looking at the piece of arm, you could only see the thumb, and our boy said he left the thumb sticking out as a kind of thumbs up for a successful surgery. Minchul asked if the guy was really going to be okay. Our boy said he didn't know, but if he didn't wake up in five minutes, they would have to leave. They didn't have time and needed to get out of there before the tattooed guys showed up. Suddenly, the guy sat up and asked what happened. Then he saw that his arm was gone. Our boy told him he probably passed out from the pain and asked how he was feeling. The guy moved his arm, saying he felt great thanks to him. Our boy said he handled it well, but he better calm down. All he had done was delay the effects of the pain, but it would come back soon. The guy fell to the ground, saying that despite everything, he was grateful. But then, everyone heard a noise outside. A guy was kicking some cars, wondering how they were going to find those bastards. Another guy with a mask told him to calm down, but in a rage, he said there was no way to fix that damn truck. Meanwhile, inside, Chiyunsu was just observing, but there were people he hadn't seen before watching them. The guy wondered why the boss wanted to fix that damn truck when there was a new one right there. The guy explained it was because that one was refrigerated. Now, Chiyunsu understood why they wanted so badly to keep that truck. They then ripped out a bunch of parts, saying at least it would look like they were working. But he was tired of following those stupid orders. He went inside and asked if those were the black tattoo people. Our boy said yes, and they would probably finish them off easily. But for now, it was better to follow them for a bit. That way, at least they would discover where they were hiding. The group agreed, and Suayan said that to avoid being discovered, it would be better to take only one person. Our boy said that might be a good idea, then glanced to the side. Yang was pointing at his own face. Outside, the guys were driving some tires until they suddenly stopped. One of them asked his friend if he had heard something, and the other told him to shut up because he was getting scared over nothing. Meanwhile, Yang wondered why he had gotten involved in something like this. Suddenly, the two thugs froze in fear, dropping the tire to the ground. They were standing face to face with Captain Sang Jinju, who said that it seemed like they were working hard, but they could calm down. They were just there to find the people who had killed three of their men. The guy said it was best if the boss never found out about it, or he would be furious. Sang said they would handle it soon, so they should just go back and entertain the boss a little. With that, they left, while Yang stood there watching. The problem was that they were heading in the direction of Chiansu's group, and now Yang didn't know whether to return to the group or keep following to learn more. He decided to stick with the plan for now and keep watching them. The guys wouldn't stop talking, and he just wanted those bastards to hurry back to base. He followed them for a bit until he decided it was enough, and turned to head back to Chiansu. However, he was shocked when he arrived. Su Aeon was kicking one guy in the knee, Minchil was smashing another in the face with a hammer, and even Harry Yang was stabbing with a scalpel. Man, this group is dangerous. Poor Yang was terrified watching this, and Chiansu asked if that guy over there was the famous Sang Jinju. Apparently, he was a lot less tough than they had heard. Sang asked if Chiansu was the bastard who killed his friends, and our boy just asked, maybe. But really, it was bold of him to hurt Minchiol with such poor skill. Sang saw Minchiol beating up his buddies and said that bastard would pay later, but our boy told him to pay more attention. Sang told him to shut up, that it wasn't over yet. However, our boy just smiled and asked if he was sure about that. At that moment, Sang Jinju, now surrounded and unsure where to run, started looking for a way out. That's when he saw Yang standing there like an idiot, frozen in place. The fool didn't react and Sang hit him in the back of the head with the handle of a knife, warning that if anyone came closer, you would kill him. Shigensu just said that Sang was even worse than he had imagined, exactly what he expected from a gang captain like him. Sang told him to shut up and stay back, but Chiansu said that in the end, all bandits were the same. Sang began to back away, telling him to stay away. Yang in pain said not to worry that it was nothing, but Sang hit him again. No mercy. The boy went down. With that, Sang started running in a panic, while Yang was writhing in pain. The chat teased, asking how Sang had the guts to do that to Chiansu's test dummy. However, our boy didn't find it funny. The guy was trying to run, but Chiansu was right behind him, and without wasting any time, he landed a strike with the axe. The fool fell to the ground, and our boy said he had a question. Did he know what kind of live stream got the most viewers? It was when someone apologized. Man, Chiansu hit him again on the arm, telling him he was still waiting. Sang had better apologize for everything he had done. The guy didn't apologize, and our boy told him to say it already. The desperate guy finally said he wanted to apologize. Our boy told him to repeat it. 
and Sang started saying it over and over. But Chidensu said no, grabbed him by the neck, and told him he had to apologize to those two over there. Not just with words, but with actions that showed it. The fool was dragged from the ground, begging Chiyunsu to wait, but he was dedicated to this apology and smashed him again. At this point, Yam, worried, called out to Chiyunsu, telling him that was enough. The guy had already turned into a stone. With that, Chiyunsu said okay and dropped him to the ground. Harry Yang then said the poison was spreading extremely fast. Cutting off the arm had helped, but it seemed like it had already gotten into the bloodstream and started spreading again. Yam apologized and said it looked like he didn't have much time left. Our boy told him there was no need to apologize and asked if he had discovered where the black tattoo base was. Yang said yes, and that he would take them there. Our boy was surprised that Yang was still able to move. The chat said that adrenaline or injuries didn't matter when you were already a zombie. Yang simply told them to follow him and he would show the way. Our boy asked Minchul if he was ready to face the problems of his past and Minchul replied that he was. A little later, Yang found himself face to face with the entire gang surrounding the truck. The poor guy was obviously not in good health and he screamed for those bastards to come at him. The gang, shocked, looked confused. They noticed that he was infected and wondered what kind of madman he was. The leader of the Black Tattoo Gang named Yang Haiyan appeared. Yang was sure it was him since Minchul had given the description. Yang said he was there to kill the leader and Yang Haiyan asked how he planned to do that, noting that he was brave for someone with no arm. Yang laughed and asked if Yang was really so eager for the afterlife. Minchul then handed him a bat. The boss was angry, saying the mood had been good because they fixed the truck, but now this bastard had shown up to ruin it. But if that was the case, he'd help him die quickly. At that moment, Yang began screaming like a madman, while the guys were distracted, not hearing anything. Suiyan was sneaking up behind them and before anyone noticed, she had already taken down the first one. Shen Yang struck the second one. It was only then that the boss realized they had already gotten close. The entire group was closing in and even a scalpel went flying into his face. At that moment, our boy was watching as the gang started screaming for help, saying they were under attack. But of course, Chiemsu wasn't going to forgive anyone. The boss began to wonder if that was death itself arriving at his base. That's when he seemed to recognize someone. It was that bastard, Minchul. Chiemsu then asked if he was the one who had messed with Minchul's life. The guy turned around asking if Chiyunsu had been hired for revenge. Our boy said he was pretty egocentric to think that way, but since that was the case, he would pay the price with his arms. The boss told him not to come any closer or he'd die. He tried to land a hit, but our boy easily blocked it, even mocking him, saying it was pretty easy to block him. The boss screamed, telling him to die, but Chiyunsu kept blocking and dodging easily. The boss couldn't understand how this skinny guy was so strong and asked who the hell he was. Our boy said he was just the guy hired by Minchiel, without bragging. The boss begged him not to come closer. Our boy said that the last allies had said the same thing. Apparently, everyone learned the same line. At that moment, the boss turned to call for his men, but was shocked. Even in his transformed state, Yang was taking down his team. That startled Chiansu, and at that moment, the boss took the opportunity to run away in desperation. Our boy glanced to the side. Yang had dropped the guy he had finished off on the ground. The chat asked if it was time to send him to the afterlife, saying he should do it like a man with a hit to the neck. He then approached, thanked him for his service, and said it was time to say goodbye. However, Harry Yang told him to wait a second, that he needed to take a closer look. Our boy asked if Yang was still with them, and Yang could only nod his head. Our boy felt a little bad since the guy was still conscious and said he didn't have a choice. However, the chat knew Yang was more dead than alive and didn't have much time left. But at least they had gotten the truck those guys had just fixed. He then asked if Yang was ready for one last job. Yang could only respond with strange sounds. Meanwhile, inside a building, the boss was hiding. He knew that bastard Minchul was different the moment he saw him, and now he had lost his entire group because of that wretch. Back in the day, Minchul was their plaything. At that moment, he heard voices saying they were going to check the building. He knew that trying to beat Minchul and those two crazy girls alone would be impossible, but he had the advantage of high ground. He couldn't get out of there alive without that truck, so he had to win. The truck, filled with fresh food, would make it easy to recruit new people, not to mention he could find some kids and train them to be extremely loyal. Just then, Minchul opened the door and the guy screamed, asking how he had the guts to betray him. But Minchul remained calm, asking what he meant by betrayal. The guy said there was no betrayal because they had treated him well, and now Minchul was being a coward. Minchul said the way they treated him wasn't as good as the guy remembered. The boss told him to shut up and said the arrogant bastard was going to die. Minchul simply responded that in the end, the boss had failed his own men since they had all died. The guy told him to stop acting like a saint since he used to be one of them. But Minchul said all he did was smoke a few cigarettes with them, he never hurt anyone. He told the boss that if he was so angry, he should come down for a fair fight. The guy said he wouldn't because he knew someone was behind that door. But that's when two feet appeared from above and the girls said they were actually up there. Surrounded, the guy told them to stay away. The girls began to descend and he panicked. Seeing that Minchul was alone seemed like his best option, so he ran at him. However, Minchul slammed the door shut and the guy crashed into it like a fool. The girls started to approach from behind, asking if he was that scared. 
Obviously, the guy ran away in desperation, telling them to stay away. He opened the back door, saying at least he hadn't run into that other bastard. He finally found the truck he had been searching for, but Chiansu appeared behind him, asking where he thought he was going. The guy ran frantically, and Chiansu told him to wait a second. However, the guy got into the truck, opened the door, and told him to stay back. Inside, he found his friend, but then took a hit to the back of the head. He wondered what had just happened. Sometime later, he regained consciousness. He saw he was leaving the place and thanked the guy next to him, saying that when he hired him, he had made the right choice. But then he noticed he was still tied up. The guy asked why he was skinnier than usual and seeing the uniform, the boss recognized it. He started screaming in panic, telling him to stop and asking where they were going. He heard a strange sound from outside and asked what was going on. Young then turned the wheel, causing the entire truck to tip over. The boss, lying on the ground, began cursing him, but then noticed some vines approaching the truck. They began invading the cabin, and poor Yang was killed on the spot. The boss started screaming, but it was too late for him as well. There was no way he was getting out of this alive. Before dying, Yang made a gentle gesture, and with that, everything exploded. From a distance, Chiansu was impressed. Yang had really attracted the detectors and blown everything up. Minchil asked why he did that since the truck would have been useful. Chiansu said it wasn't worth it, something that big would only consume too much gas. He asked Minchil if he was sad about losing his friend, who told him to shut up or leave the guy was gone. Then he asked Suyan if she liked the truck. She said she wasn't much of a fan of small cars. Kiansu told her gas was too expensive, so she should be careful not to waste what they had. Suddenly, Harion appeared with a bunch of watches, saying she had looted the bodies. Our boy asked if she was robbing the dead, and Suyan said she was cute. Harion said she wasn't looting the bodies, she was just having fun. To please her, Kiansu told her to grab one for him as well. To him, the group wasn't so bad after all. Each one had their own specialty, and they were getting along well. Suyan then asked where they were going next and he said maybe to Jeju Island. He then asked the chat if it was better to go by boat or plane and everyone seemed confused. He didn't know what to do and told them to start heading east. They needed to find another safe area and he believed that was the best direction. Along the way, they saw a bunch of holes and Harry Yang said they were probably made by the vines that Guy had mentioned. As soon as our boy crossed the blue line, he reached a new stage of the mission. And with that, he unlocked the skill function and could even take a look. He used a new function and the system told him to use the verbal command offer to activate it. The shop was available and you could check the details. Considering this, heading east seemed like the best choice and the people on the live stream were eager to see the new features. He still had the two skills from before and now he also had a new one from the master that allowed him to see through someone else's eyes for 10 minutes when he touched them. However, unlike the other abilities, this one could only be used once. He was annoyed that he could only have three level one skills and three level two skills. The chat laughed at him, telling him that's why there's a delete button. He asked what would happen if he gained a new skill when he was already at the limit, and they told him he'd have to delete another one to make room for the new one. Our boy felt isolated, as this restriction put him at a disadvantage. The chat suggested he check the shop and other functions, so he said offer, and suddenly a microphone appeared next to him. He realized he could create a mission and said he wanted to earn 100 zines for eating food. The mission was created, but the chat called him an idiot, saying no one was going to give him 100 zines for eating something. A timer appeared, coming down, and he asked what would happen when it reached zero. When that moment came, the mission failed, and everything was cancelled. That's when he realized that the mission he offered had to be accepted by someone. He then said he wanted to offer a mission to become invincible, which would cost 1 million zines. The chat said it was obvious it wouldn't be that easy for him to get an overpowered ability. He had already failed two offers, and if he failed one more, he wouldn't be able to request any more missions for the day. But for him, it was worth it, because at least now he understood how it worked. He decided to take a look at the shop, but just as he was about to say, shop, Suyan suddenly braked. He asked what happened, and she told him to look ahead. The road was completely blocked and full of holes. However, he realized that it seemed like something people had done. They were unfortunately forced to get out and continue on foot. Clearly, it was some kind of trap, and they would need to be careful. On the other side of the bridge, there were still many cars falling and on fire. Minshul asked if they were really going to cross, and our boy said they had no choice. Since the line he crossed to complete the mission was in that direction, it had to be the right path. The chat commented that he was lucky to have an intact bridge in an apocalyptic world. Our boy said they needed to take advantage of it because once the bridge collapsed, things would get much harder. He noticed a military binoculars but didn't say anything and kept walking. Suddenly, an explosion occurred. One of the bridge's legs had been destroyed. Harry Yong said the entire bridge was going to collapse at that rate, and they had to cross quickly. Man, those guys were brave, running across like that. He then made an offer for them to safely get through the flames with the reward being double speed. However, the chat told him that would cost 100 zines. The problem was, they knew something was wrong ahead because of the high price. He couldn't pay for that mission and would now go a day without being able to request another one. Suddenly, there was a flash of light in front of them, and once again, the entire bridge began to shake. The pillar below was being destroyed, and not only that, the entire bridge was starting to crack. 
Harry Young tried to grab his hand because our boy was falling and man, it looked like he wasn't going to make it. The bridge split right in the middle and Chien Su had already fallen into the water, struggling to stay alive and reaching out for someone to help him. A voice was telling him to swim left. He tried, but the current was much stronger. The voice then told him to swim right. The poor guy realized he had no talent for this. He needed to get there. It was just a little further. The voice kept saying he was almost there and he wondered what it was talking about. But another piece of the bridge collapsed. Time passed and Chien Su woke up in the middle of nowhere. The poor guy got up completely exhausted with the live stream cheering that he was still alive. Our boy, worn out, thanked them for waking him up. That's when he realized he was far from the bridge and didn't know where his friends were. The chat said they were probably swept away too, and now finding everyone would be really difficult. The poor guy couldn't believe everything went from 100 to 0 so quickly. At least he noticed that Harry Ong's bag was with him. He told the chat that he was in a tough spot. He only had this bag and no idea where any of his friends were. The chat said everyone already knew that and had just told him. Our boy said he was really sad and that if a livestream donor could help, it would be amazing. The viewers told him to shut up, saying his friends were probably already dead. Our boy insisted, telling them to stop joking because this was an emergency. But then the chat told him to forget it, asking if he was okay and saying that he would find new friends soon. That's when he realized that since the city of Maungshan, this was the first time he was completely alone. The chat said he'd always been a loner. Our boy explained that back then, he chose to be a loner. There was a difference. The chat then said if he was determined to cross the river, he could make a raft. Our boy thought maybe it wouldn't be so bad since he was alone, so it would be easy. That's when a boat full of soldiers started approaching. He hid and listened to the guys talking about how they managed to destroy the bridge. The chat said it looked like the perfect transportation had arrived. However, the soldiers were discussing how this should prevent anyone from crossing. At that moment, Kianzu recognized these bastards as Division 7.5. Out of nowhere, one of the soldiers started shouting, asking who was there. It turned out to be just a little dog standing nearby. The guy said he thought it was those things again, and the other said that if it were, things would have gotten messy. He then told the team to turn the boat around and head back because everything was destroyed anyway. But Chiansu wanted that boat and didn't want them to leave. That's when one of the vines attacked from behind, ricocheted off the motor, and hit the soldier directly. Chiansu was shocked. How was there a detector vine here when they were so far from them? That's when he realized it was actually a cruel tree zombie. The monster pulled the guy's body in and started tearing it apart absorbing him. The others tried to shoot, but you can't kill a tree with bullets. Meanwhile, poor Chiyun Su was almost a gunner. The body of the guy with the gun was thrown toward him, and thank God the gun landed right next to him. But he noticed that the guy's body was starting to look dried out as if it was being drained. You never imagined he'd come across a creature that was a fusion of a zombie and a tree monster. Meanwhile, the last soldier was trying to start the motor again, which had stopped working when the branch hit it. But he was in for a scare, as the tree attacked him as well. However, this time, Chiansu delivered a clean blow right in the middle of the branch. The chat was confused, asking what he was doing. He explained that the tree already knew he was there and the soldier was the perfect distraction. He then shouted at the tree, telling him to stay away. The creature tried to slide down the side of the dam but slipped and fell into the water. Strangely, instead of absorbing the water, it began to be carried away. Meanwhile, the soldier was trying to get away. Chiansu told him to stop and start swimming toward him. The guy was about to ask why he should do that when a bullet whizzed by his head. Our boy told him he wasn't going to ask twice, so the soldier started swimming toward him. A little while later, the poor guy was being interrogated, and our boy told him to answer where they came from. At least he was safe now, so he better be honest. He then asked the guy what exactly Division 7.5 was. The problem was, the guy didn't seem too eager to respond. Our boy just watched as the chat commented that the guy was really ugly, like he was in his 20s. Another person said if that were the case, he looked just like Chinansu. Our boy asked if they had forgotten that he was beautiful. Then he turned to the guy and said he didn't have a dog tag and was staring too much. So he hit him in the eye to help him see better. The guy cursed, asking why he did that. Our boy pointed the gun at him and told him to explain why they destroyed the bridge. But the guy didn't seem very motivated. Then Chiansu whipped him in the thigh, then again on the foot before he could say anything, and another hit landed on his shoulder. The guy finally told him to stop. Chiansu warned him that until he answered, he'd keep getting hits. He better start talking about why they blew up the bridge and why they were messing with him. The guy then admitted he was from Division 7.5. Chiansu said he already knew that and fired another shot, but then smiled, realizing he had forgotten to remove the safety from the gun. The guy called him a bastard. Our boy told him it was better to start spilling the truth to the bastard. Why was Division 7.5 gathering people? It didn't make sense to call everyone together and then destroy the bridge. He told the guy to explain the reason behind it all. Then the guy said the end and Chiansu asked if he was going to tell the truth or not. The guy already knew what Chiansu had said. The end was the password the soldier had given. Chiansu asked why he looked confused, saying he knew the password because he was joining them. The chat said the guy wouldn't believe it after getting shot so many times. The guy asked if Chiansu was really a VIP, and our boy said he was on his way, but a whole mess happened. 
which is why he was delayed. The guy couldn't believe they made such a big mistake, and Chienzu told him to explain why they were blowing up the bridges. However, the guy said that even if he was a VIP, telling him that would only complicate things further. Our boy asked why he was so hesitant. He was also a combat mercenary, which is why he liked to relieve stress this way. The chat was laughing, wondering what the fool was talking about. The guy was still hesitating, and Chiansu told him that if he answered everything, he'd take him with him. He should know that Chiansu was an expert and could take care of him, so it was better to just talk. Our boy's roleplay was getting pretty serious, and the guy hesitated, saying that what he knew might not be enough. He then explained that Division 7.5 was a secret military unit trained to act during national crisis. Their job was to efficiently gather people and resources to rebuild a collapsed society. Our boy seemed skeptical of this story, and the chat said he was bad at hiding his emotions. He then asked if only part of Division 7.5 was in the Dajian area. The guy said yes, but he didn't know exactly how many members there were. He then asked what the forces and that guy's group were doing and where they were going. The guy said, unfortunately, he couldn't share that information. Our boy was getting frustrated with how hard it was to get any info out of this jerk. He then asked if the guy's destination was Jeju Island or if it was because he heard it was safe. He remembered back at the hospital when he heard that message on the radio about safety in Daejeon and how Division 7.5 recommended people head there. He then told the guy to explain how they planned to reach the island. The guy said the plan was for everyone to go to Chiansu Airport. Something seemed off because our boy didn't believe it. The guy, now dripping a little, said maybe he needed some treatment. Our boy agreed. The guy then told him to hurry up because no more lifeboats were coming for them. Our boy said he seemed tired, so he would ask just one more question. If the job was to gather people and they were blowing up the bridge, did that mean they already had everyone they needed? The guy said it was kind of like that as they didn't need any more civilians. Taking too many people would make it difficult to control everyone. This business of keeping everyone in line didn't sit well with our boy. He said that gathering people to help rebuild society was noble and really helped prevent panic and chaos. However, blowing up the bridge so no one could cross. I was going too far. To him, something smelled fishy about the whole thing. The guy yelled that they were trying to rebuild the country and weren't some kind of rebels. Chiansu asked if he really believed that made sense. The guy couldn't seem to respond. At that moment, Chiansu pointed the gun and said it was okay, but he had already heard everything he needed. The guy asked if he was really going to be killed after telling him everything. Our boy said, unfortunately, he couldn't be friendly with someone like him. Seeing a zombie nearby, he said he knew an old friend who hadn't been seen in a while. He then opened the door, grabbed the guy by the head, and said it was time to pay for what he did to his friends. As the guy was devoured inside, our boy walked away, now with the problem of how to cross. At least that tree zombie wasn't around anymore, but that didn't mean another one couldn't appear. He then opened the shop and found a 10 meter rope for one zen. Someone in the chat suggested he look for an inflatable too, and he had access to an amazing rubber duck float. The chat was laughing at him. Our boy wondered if that was all the shop had. The shop notified him that the items would change, and what was available now might not appear again. He asked what was going on, and the chat said they had no idea either. Our boy said he hadn't even paid for the only one yet. Could someone help him get it for free? The maxed out card donated one coin to him. The chat was being generous, and everyone started donating one coin. He then asked why they never donated when he was in the middle of the action. The chat said they maxed out card, had already spent a lot on him, and was probably trying to be a big fan. Our boy recognized that this was something common in livestream systems, and it looked like it was happening in his life too. The problem was, he still owed 10 zines for the only one. Even worse, his friends in the boat from earlier had all floated away with the current. The maxed out card kept donating, but our boy said he didn't need that much and that he could manage from now on. He didn't want his golden goose to disappear like that. But that's when they heard a noise, and the chat told him to take a look. The damn tree monster had returned. Immediately, our boy started running, but he was shocked to see the monster was moving incredibly fast. He turned a corner, saying this was his only chance. The chat wondered why he was running in circles. This was going to get dangerous. He managed to close the door and ran up the stairs. A little while later, he was on the upper floor, relieved he hadn't been discovered. He made it to the top floor and kicked the door open. Down below, he could see the creature trembling. He realized it wanted to get back to the river, which would be a problem for him. He then grabbed some food and started chewing it down quickly. The chat was wondering why he was doing this now. He then threw the can and said this was where that monster would die. Before anything could happen, he was already running back down. Man, the guy was still a little desperate, and the chat was completely confused about what he was doing. Our boy attempted some parkour of jumping from one building to another, but he felt like an idiot. The chat teased him, saying he was trying too hard to look cool. Our boy said he'd just try again. He took another jump and face planted into the ground. The chat said it'd be better to die to the tree than like this, but he didn't give up and got up again. Once more, the maniac jumped, but this time he landed in style. 
The chat said the third time's always the charm. He then looked down the street, grabbed a can in his hand, and wondered what he was doing. He knew that sometimes monsters fought each other, and considering there were vines nearby, suddenly several of them emerged from the ground. He told them to fight to the death. While they fought, he ran down the stairs. What he needed to do now was find a way to cross the river while they fought. The zombie was caught in the vines and couldn't attack him, so he easily ran past, waving goodbye. However, he heard cracking sounds and saw the creature was already breaking free. He had to run and cross as quickly as possible. Fortunately, the water level was lower and the current seemed slower. The chat asked where his courage was and told him to just jump in and swim. The problem was that he knew he was bad at swimming. Then he saw the creature coming after him. In a panic, he begged for 11 zines. The chat asked if he was going to buy that donut float and he said yes, pleading with them to send the money quickly. But they kept teasing him, saying there was a bakery nearby, telling him to go buy something and take a look around. Our boy told them to stop laughing at him and hand over the donuts before he died. With that, he jumped into the water, and the chat told him to calm down. Even though the water seemed calm on the surface, the current below was still strong. The maxed out card and a bunch of others created a joint mission. He would receive the 11 zines after crossing two-thirds of the river. He got angry because two-thirds was almost the other side, and worst of all, even the tree monster had entered the water, chasing him. He kept struggling to cross, and the chat told him to stop looking back. There was no time for that. He was about to reach the two-thirds mark, thinking the creature might have drowned. Finally, the mission was completed and he received the reward. He immediately opened the shop and bought the float too. A circle of light appeared floating above him and suddenly, the rubber duck float dropped in front of him. But at the same moment, the tree grabbed his foot. He started kicking, telling it to let him go. It seemed like the creature had been dragged by the current, and he was safe for now. The chat told him not to give up after getting the zines. He said he was just fighting the current while the creature was being carried away. However, that's when he heard something. The monster had done the same thing and was coming up behind him. He had no more zines and needed to figure out a way to create distance from it. He stretched out in a straight line to let the current carry him faster. The chat was confused, saying it was impossible to know what he was thinking. The biggest problem was that the middle of the river was full of debris from the collapsed bridge. One wrong move and he could get stuck, or worse, something could fall on his head. But he had no choice and kept going straight. The chat joked that he was wriggling away like a worm. Then he saw the bridge start to collapse because the tree couldn't pass. He flipped the bird at the creature and told it to get lost, just as the bridge collapsed on top of it. Some time later, he was exhausted, saying that was way too hard, and the chat teased that he looked like he had aged 10 years. But again, he noticed something unexpected. A little dog from earlier was swimming peacefully. He called out to it, and the dog even looked back at him. Our boy asked for help, telling the dog to lead him to the shore. The chat was confused, watching this guy talk to a dog. However, the dog actually heard him and headed toward him. It circled around and our boy got emotional, asking for help. But suddenly, the dog turned and walked away. The chat joked that the dog must have realized what a horrible personality he had and decided to abandon him. Our boy said it was fine, that he could make it on his own. However, he then noticed the dog seemed to be showing him the way to the weaker current. It turned out the dog was smarter than he thought. Some time later, he finally made it out of the river, exhausted, thanking the guys. The dog came over, all happy, and our boy knew it won a reward. He gave the precious fish he had, saying he knew the dog must be hungry. The chat asked what he was going to do now, warning that the soldiers could show up at any moment. He said he already knew and was on his way. First, he needed to get to the Dejan Terminal. He was checking the routes on his map when the dog seemed to notice something. It started barking, and that's when something strange happened. A bus pulled up at the stop. An old man shouted from inside, telling him to get in. Shiansu was completely confused. The guy told him to hop in if he wanted to survive because there were a bunch of dogs coming, or rather, some transformed wolves. At that moment, our boy jumped in, and the chat told him to bring the dog with him. He looked back, seeing the dog standing there staring at him. He told it to hurry and get in. With that, the driver told him to hold on tight, and off they went at 100 miles per hour. Our boy was confused about what was chasing them, and the chat said they were gray wolves, creatures that were really annoying to deal with. Someone in the chat suggested throwing that black ball out as bait to distract the wolves. Chiansu, confused, asked why they were talking about sacrificing the dog when they just told him to save it a minute ago. He opened the back window, and the driver asked what he thought he was doing. Our boy said he'd handle it, while the dog just stared at him. Our boy pulled him away from the window and told him to be careful. He said he'd take care of this. At that moment, he screamed, drawing the wolves' attention. The aggro went to six, and the wolves went wild. Kiansu threw a can, saying it was time to eat, and it hit one of the wolves directly in the face, causing it to crash into another, and both tumbled backward. One of them was bigger than the others, and it had a scar on its face, so that was probably the leader. If that was the case, he had to take it down. He landed a blow right in the leg. The beast howled, but it kept moving forward. Chiansu was shocked that the creature didn't fall, but finally its leg gave out, and it collapsed. All the other wolves seemed to stop and just stare at it, giving the bus enough time to get away. Our boy was relieved that this whole mess was finally over. 
The driver introduced himself as Chang Sik Park and asked where the boy came from. Qian Zhu realized he had been rescued, even though he was a complete stranger, and explained that he came from the other side of the river. The driver asked how, as far as he had heard, the bridges had all been destroyed. Qian Zhu confirmed that was true and he had swum across. However, to Qian Zhu, this guy seemed even more unbelievable than he did, so he asked where the driver had come from. The driver said, of course, he came from the bus garage. Our boy said he figured that, but what he really wanted to know was why a bus was still running in circumstances like these. The driver explained that he came after meeting a soldier at the Dejun station. It seemed they were protecting people there, and everyone was about to leave soon, which is why they were calling for a few buses. Kansu wondered why they needed buses for that, but the guy simply said he was trying to save the last few people before the soldiers left. His whole life he had driven this bus, taking people from the city to the Dejun terminal, and doing it one last time was his life's mission. As long as he could find people along the way, he wouldn't stop. He was going to save them. The chat was amazed, saying he was the complete opposite of Qiansu. Qiansu then asked Chang Sik if he planned to stop every bus stop, to which the driver replied that he would only stop where the terminal staff had instructed. Besides, those monsters earlier had caught him off guard, but the kid was incredible and managed to shake them off. Our boy asked how long it would take and the driver said at least 15 minutes. Qiansu leaned back and the chat asked if he was going to take a nap. He replied, unfortunately, no. Even though Chang Sik seemed like a good person, he couldn't trust anyone. That was the downside of not having his friends around. He then told the chat that he wanted to ask something, or if they thought he was about to ask for money. They said no, so he said he wanted to talk about the whole superfan thing and questioned if, since that existed, there had to be more to this system. The chat told him he wasn't supposed to know about that yet, and it was all the fault of the maxed out card. Our boy told them not to blame the maxed out card, because it was just appreciating the love it had shown. The chat even joked that his speech bubble came out in the shape of a heart. He then said his question was serious, and that there had to be something else like that. The chat asked, like what? Are you talking about zines? Our boy said it was what every streamer needed, moderators. Everyone seemed shocked again and told him he wasn't supposed to know about that either. Our boy asked if having a moderator now was that serious and seeing their reaction, he asked if they were scared. Apparently, he was supposed to have moderator powers and they were afraid he would use them. The chat seemed spooked, saying they'd been found out. However, Chiansu reassured them, saying not to worry, he wasn't going to do anything to them. They already knew, right? He would only keep around those who were paying. He then told them to explain how the moderator system worked because he wanted some super fans. Suddenly, he was thrown across the bus, and Chiansu warned that there were some wolves on the left. Man, the creatures were throwing themselves against the glass. They looked like three from the same group as before, but he didn't see the leader. He had seen the wolves give up when the leader fell, so something felt off about them being here. One of them started howling, and apparently Chiansu had some kind of animal instinct because he realized it was an ambush. He immediately told Chang Sik that they had to get out of there. The driver tried to argue, but Chiansu told him that if they stayed, they wouldn't be able to save anyone since they would both die. There were definitely more wolves than he thought, and they needed to leave. He heard another wolf howling and knew they were probably in its territory. He warned Chang Sik that the wolves were coming from the right and he couldn't let the bus tip over. Chang Sik said he'd make sure of that and told him to hold on tight. Both of them needed to get out of there as quickly as possible. But now there were six wolves following them and they were constantly throwing themselves at the bus. The chat said those creatures had gone crazy and would soon break into the bus. Our boy was worried that if those creatures got inside, it would be nearly impossible to fight them off. At that moment, something hit the wheel and Chang Sik warned that they had a problem. The bus was veering to the side. The chat told him to throw the dog out as a distraction for the wolves, but our boy only saw the dog looking all cute. Then he noticed his aggro skill wasn't activated, which meant the dog wasn't the wolves' target. He then told Chang Sik to open the back door. The driver questioned if he was crazy, saying that if the wolves got in, they'd be dead. Qiansu said it didn't matter because at this rate, they were going to die anyway. The driver didn't listen, so Qiansu opened the door himself and warned Chang Sik to close it the moment they got inside. Qiansu then let out a scream and finally managed to pull the aggro of the first wolf. Chang Sik quickly slammed the door shut. However, of course, that first wolf made it in. Our ruthless boy said that was fine. It was time for the wolf to get a taste of the 10 strike axe. He first knocked the wolf away, but he wasn't about to stop there and started landing more strikes in quick succession, all while asking why this damn thing was following them. The chat was surprised that he had defeated the creature so easily. He then asked what Chang Sik was doing and told him to open the door, but two more wolves rushed in at that moment, and there he went again with his combo. The chat seemed unsure he could handle two, but he seemed to be managing it with ease. That was until one wolf nearly bit his face. He dodged and a creature fell near the driver, causing Chang Sik to swerve, throwing Qian Su to the side. But he quickly regained his footing and said he would finish this with just one more strike. That's when he noticed the creature was too close to hit with his axe, so he kneaded it in the head to shut its mouth. Now he could pull out the axe and the beast began to whimper. Even the little dog, who Qian Su had already named Furball, was biting at the wolf's paw, helping to take down another one. Some time later, Qian Su was exhausted. 
Chang Sik complimented him, saying he was incredible and asked how he could fight like that. Our boy replied that he had been training his whole life, and the chat joked that he was starting to bluff again. He looked at Furball and said it was time for them to take a walk. With that, the two of them opened the door and stepped outside. Chang Sik was beginning to worry since the bus was nearing its limit. But off they went with two more wolves in tow, and Qian Su went outside to finish them off. Regretting it, Chang Sik even donated three years off his life, saying he should have done this from the start. Our boy thanked him and said he had a plan to handle it. He had told Chang Sik that as soon as he stepped out of the bus, he should wait five seconds and then honk the horn. When the horn blared, the wolves were startled and turned toward the noise. Hansu took advantage of the moment, quickly finishing off the first one, and with another slash, the second was done for two. With the street painted red, he told Furball to get back on the bus. He then jokingly asked the chat if the dog was some kind of item or NPC, and the chat laughed, saying it was just a smart stray dog. He said he understood, but at least it seemed to listen to him. Someone in the chat commented that certain animals were as good as rare items, though they were hard to come by. However, our boy humiliated Furball, saying that didn't seem to be the case with him. One of the problems now was that the back tire had been punctured by a bite. Chang Sik came out and asked if he was okay. Qian Su said yes, but now they'd have to walk the rest of the way. Chang Sik was shocked, but said it might work since it was only a few minutes away. Our boy warned that they had to move fast, because if that wolf was flying around, more could show up at any moment. He made it clear that he would only accompany him until they found the soldiers. Meanwhile, at the Dejan terminal, a crowd of people was shouting, demanding to be let in, saying they had arrived first. Inside, the soldiers wondered how much longer they had to stay there. One of them explained that someone from the other group had asked for more time, but another soldier said it was impossible for more people to be outside. He said he believed they had already done enough because no one else would make it out of that mess. If no one else had made it, it was because they were all useless. All they needed were a few refugees to serve as decoys for them to reach the airport. But suddenly, they heard a scream and everyone turned their guns. It was Chang Sik, screaming for help as he was being chased by a pack of wolves. The people panicked, shouting that the creatures were coming their way and the soldiers were furious because they had been about to leave. They started shooting, bullets flying everywhere. One of the soldiers stepped forward, calling for a ceasefire. Chien Su thought they had killed the old man, but Chang Sik thanked them for saving him. One of the soldiers approached the wolf, thinking something wasn't right. How did this old man escape creatures that were so agile? The soldier asked the captain if something was wrong. The captain wondered how the old man had made it there alone. Another soldier said that since he was wearing a driver's uniform, maybe his vehicle had broken down nearby. The captain said that was possible, but things were getting chaotic just as they were about to leave. Chang Sik introduced himself to the captain, saying it was good to see him. The captain told him to stop making pleasantries while they were outside because he didn't want anyone to know he was a high-ranking soldier. He then said he had received word from the other teams and told them to prepare to head to Shenzhou Airport. He reminded the captain that while the people at Daejeon Station wanted to work together, they were going to take all the glory for themselves. He also reminded the soldier that, as his number one, it was his job to live up to expectations while they were on their way to Chengdu. Nearby, Qian Su was relieved that the old man hadn't been shot, and the chat commented that there had been way more gunfire than they expected. Our boy knew this was because of the huge number of wolves. He thanked Mr. Park as he headed to one of the buses. The chap told him to be careful. There might be something in there. That's when he heard a noise and hid behind one of the cars. The chat seemed to recognize the guy carrying the keys. A little earlier, Qian Su had mentioned the guy at the terminal who was collecting the keys from all the cars, probably holding them for his friends since he worked at the terminal office. Suddenly, someone called out to him. It was Qian Su who said not to worry because he was just someone who had recently arrived. The man told him to go talk to the soldiers because they would be leaving soon. Qian Su asked if he was just collecting the car keys. The man told him to stop bothering him because he was busy and to stay away. Our boy asked if he wasn't planning to leave. The man said no, because he was waiting for a friend. Right away, Qian Su asked if that friend was the one who left him with the keys. The man demanded to know who told him that. Qian Su said he heard it from the driver of bus number two. The man, a bit embarrassed, wondered why that old man had gone around telling everyone. He then confirmed that his friend had left the keys and hadn't returned yet. He asked if the old man was still alive. Qian Su said he was probably with the soldiers, and the man asked why Qian Su was there. Our boy said he had his reasons. There were a lot of things he needed to resolve. The man asked if Qian Su was trying to steal a car after all the effort he had put into gathering them. Qian Su said he just wanted to borrow one and that the man could even come with him if he wanted. However, the man said he couldn't leave because when people came to collect the cars, he had to be there. Qian Su questioned if he was really waiting for his friend. The man replied that his friend's only job was to return with the keys, so he was sure he would come back. But the man handed over a key, saying the car was working and no one had claimed it. He just needed to press the button, and he'd find out. Qian Su thanked him and said he hoped he'd find his friend soon. But his expression quickly changed. The boy had just gotten a new toy to drive around the city. With no other choice, he got in. What else could he do? At least the car had GPS. And just then, the shop updated. 
There was an item that for two zines could make his car go up to 300 kilometers slash F for seven minutes. However, if the car slowed down after reaching top speed, it would disappear in 60 minutes. Our boy thought this item was way too cool for something that only cost two zines. The chat told him to give up on it if he didn't have the guts to drive at 300 kilometers slash hey. Our boy asked if they really thought he was scared of an item and of course, bought it immediately. Once again, that same flash of light appeared above him, and in front of him, a little ramp with an arrow dropped down. Man, it hit him right on the nose. Meanwhile, Furball was just staring at him and Chiensu cursed at him. But with no other option, it was time to go. He started the GPS, buckled up, and accelerated. He was going to find his friends soon. However, the car didn't seem that fast at first. The guy then said that the soldiers had just left the terminal and wished him good luck. Our boy thanked him and said he hoped he'd find his friend. Then he said that if anyone came looking for him, they should just say he went ahead to Jeju Island. The man didn't seem too excited to hear that name, but Chiansu just said he would keep his distance while following the soldiers. The army and the civilians were already on the road. Everyone felt slightly relieved since the path seemed safe, and of course, the soldiers wouldn't abandon them. The only thing Chiansu found strange was that they always seemed to be walking ahead, and maybe they should slow down. But the driver told everyone not to worry, as he was sure they were going slow for a reason. Everyone was murmuring, but no one said anything. That's when one of the soldiers appeared, shouting that there were monsters ahead. The people went to check, and suddenly, they saw like this video that helps Mamoru make more juicy content for his viewers, activate the cheeky little bell, and I'm out.